Good afternoon, everybody. Hello and welcome to Flight Simulation Association's Cross the Pond Pilot Briefing for Westbound 2022. My name is Evan, the co-founder of Flight Simulation Association, the folks who put on Flight Sim Expo. You may also have recognized me from the VATSIM network. I'm a controller in the Boston area. If you've ever flown in Boston Center and you've been flown through the localizer, flown into some terrain, or if you're really lucky, flown into another airplane, that was probably me. So that's where you may recognize me from. On the screen with me, we have David and Rob, who I'll be introducing in just a couple of minutes as we get set to go. Uh, so firstly, where are you watching? Say hello in whichever chat you may be looking at right now. There's a whole bunch of places that you may be watching. You might be watching on the Flight Sim Association website. You might be watching on VATSIM's YouTube or Twitch with Slant Alpha Adventures or David live on Twitch right now. VATSIM Spain, VAT Can, Gander Oceanic, our friends at FS Elite or VAT USA, or maybe there's even somewhere I don't know about. Anything's possible. So say hello wherever you might be watching right now. We've got Mar moderators available for all of these channels. And so if you have questions, which I'm sure people will have questions, we're going to have lots of time to answer those at the end of our live presentation. So if you have questions, you can put those in the chat wherever you might be watching. And those moderators have promised that they're going to send them to me. I will collect them all, try to put them in some kind of an order, and then we'll feed them through to Rob and David as we get to the end of the live presentation. Just about 50 to 55 minutes from now, we'll start taking those questions. Moderators, friendly reminder, maybe a good time to introduce yourselves in your channels, say who you are, ask people, uh, maybe tell people how you want them to ask questions if there's a specific format, and make sure that you send those questions my way so I can make sure we pass them on to the folks who are actually going to answer them. Now, we're going to get started in about five or 10 minutes with Rob and David. So now's a good time to grab a drink, a coffee, tea, whatever you may be into. If it's late enough and you're in Europe and it's time for a beer, that works too. Rob's got his Red Bull, I'm sure, because he always has Red Bull. I said I wasn't going to say it, and then I did. Um, so yeah, yeah, they'll be getting started about five to 10 minutes as we allow people a couple minutes to just get going here. And I want to say a hello to Callum at FS Elite, who is watching this live. Uh, you can see Callum, I've got your t-shirt on. This is the FS Elite t-shirt way back from uh, when we did Flight Sim Expo in 2019. He was giving these out. And for those of you who don't know this, FS Elite is actually looking for team members right now. So if you are someone who's interested in reporting, live streaming, making some content for FS Elite, head on over to their website or Callum is probably in the YouTube chat right now and he can answer questions about that as well. Really interesting way to give back to the flight simulation community for those of you who have some experience in those areas. So what we're talking about today, once Rob and David get going about five minutes from now, is Cross the Pond. It's VATSIM's largest annual event. Now, if you don't know what VATSIM is, or if you don't know what Cross the Pond is, very quickly, it's VATSIM is one of the largest online air traffic control networks. You can learn more about them at our website. And Cross the Pond is the biggest annual event that we do at VATSIM. The official numbers say 1,000 pilots and 200 controllers. I think it'll be a little higher than that usually. And the way the event works is everybody starts over in Europe. They pick an airport to fly to in North America from one of the pre-selected airports. They fly across the ocean. And the really magical part about Cross the Pond is we have full ATC coverage all the way across. So that's really interesting. And you can't guarantee that any other day of the year. This is the westbound event, of course, so we're going from Europe to North America. And really important, a slot is required. So because there's so much traffic, so many people want to fly this event, to keep the event sustainable, what the organizers have done is put in slot restrictions. So only people who've booked a slot and have confirmed that slot are actually able to participate in the transatlantic portion of the event. So what does that mean for you if you don't have a slot? Doesn't mean you can't fly. It just means please, please, please don't fly across the ocean there are a lot of people who have put in so much work to making this event work well and work sustainably. And a big part of that, the part that you can play, is by not flying across the pond unless you have a booked slot. There is a very limited capacity. So if you're somebody who doesn't have a slot, a couple things you can do. Firstly, in about an hour at 19 Zulu, top of the hour, get the F5 key ready to do some refreshing because you may be able to actually book a slot. All the slots that haven't been booked, they're coming live for you to book at 19 GMT, top of the hour. And if not, fly domestically. There's so many options. You know, you can fly to some of the departure airports in Europe, flying into a place, for example, like Gap 
Chatwick, we'll see all the lineup of departures and you won't have any delays. Or in North America, take off from somewhere like Boston or Philly, which are our arrival airports, take off before all the traffic comes in and head west. There's going to be controllers on in other parts of the world that are wishing they had traffic during Cross the Pond Day. So pay them some visits and give them something to do while everyone else is flying and cross the pond. And finally, what should you fly? This is a common question. What we're generally looking for, the way this event is structured, is for people flying modern airliners that they are familiar with. So not something that's just come out that you haven't had a chance to really learn. Fly something that you know and that you can perform all the maneuvers that you need to, something that can do GPS waypoints. And I know people, there's always somebody who loves to fly the Concorde. That's just not the purpose of this event. If you fly the Concorde, you're going to get there before the controllers are even there. It doesn't make any sense. And you're going to be treated as most likely non-event traffic. You may not even get any oceanic coverage. So again, the purpose of this event is get a slot, fly an airplane that it's designed for, i.e. an airliner that has modern equipment, and you'll have a great experience. And for those of you who don't have a slot, the system is set up so that next time around you have a greater chance of participating. And again, don't forget 19Z today, you'll have the chance to pick up a slot if you don't have one. Let me bring on and introduce today Rob and David, our two presenters. How are you guys doing? Rob, how are you doing today? Doing well, Evan. How are you? I'm Pleasure well. To be here. And David? Yeah, doing amazing as well today. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you guys for doing this. These are two content creators, controllers, pilots who've been heavily involved in cross the pond planning for many years. And they're here today for you guys to be able to share their experience and just do a little bit to help us all get more familiar with procedures on both sides of the Atlantic. If you fly regularly in Europe, you may not know North America so well and vice versa. For me, I'm a controller in North America. I would be terrified to go to Europe. So these guys are going to help get me prepared alongside the rest of you, I hope. Uh, Rob, how many cross the ponds is it? Do we decide? Uh, yeah, so I've been over the last 10, uh, 10 events, I've participated in eight out of 10. I've only missed two, and unfortunately, I am going to miss the one a week from today as well. I'm <sighs> Slacker. So, a huge bummer, yeah, but uh, it'll only be the third one out of the last 11 that I'll have missed. So, pretty good record. And David basically controls at every Vatson facility in the world. So you, you can tell us everything right. about everywhere yeah. because you're an expert at all those places. So good person <laughs> to answer all of your questions because he controls in Europe. He's the operations director at Gander Oceanic. He visits at my facility, Boston in North America. There's probably more that I'm not even thinking of. So a great person to answer all the questions about how things differ. And I'm Evan and I'm part of Flight Simulation Association. We're the folks who are putting on this. We've done the work to organize it, put the slides together, help just do all the coordination that has to happen with one of these things. And we're really happy to be here working with Vatsim, VatUSA, and content creators like Rob and David. You know, Vatsim is always saying we want to do more in terms of pilot outreach, working with the community, learning. You know, sometimes I hear from controllers saying, you know, I don't know if these pilots are as good as they can be. I don't ever have that experience really myself, but I have heard that, right? So here we are doing that exact thing. If you're a content creator, if you're a controller, and you've been one of those people who's like, oh, pilot quality, pilot quality, here's your chance. Pass those pilots this link because we are trying to do stuff like that to reach out to pilots. I hope there's lots of people who are watching today planning to fly across the pond. I know that the amount of work that you guys as pilots do to prepare yourselves for this is impressive. I know that my experience controlling across the pond, every pilot I talk to is really well prepared. You know your stuff and it's always a lot of fun because of that. So what are we doing today? Well, we're helping with that mission by helping you gain a better understanding of European operations for the departure. We're we're talking about the oceanic portion of the flight, NAT track, whether or not we need position reports, all those things are going to come up. And then we're going to hear tips and best practices for the arrivals in Canada and the United States. There are a couple of airports in the Caribbean that are a little bit maybe more like Europe than they are North America in terms of ICAO procedures. We're not covering a whole lot of specifics on that, but I'll tell you where you can find some more detail on flying in and out of the Caribbean in just a couple minutes. And I'll say also that this session is designed for reasonably experienced VATS and jet pilots. So if you're brand new to online ATC, this will give you some nice things to know, but this isn't really for you. We're talking to people who've been flying on the network for a little while. Maybe this is your first cross the pond. Maybe this is your seventh or eighth or ninth or tenth cross the pond. But we're talking to those people who've got experience flying on the network. 
And the best resource that we're going to be able to give you along with many others today is the Cross the Pond Dashboard Pilot Briefing. So on the Cross the Pond Dashboard, once you've booked your slot, you'll have access to pilot briefings. There'll be one for your departure airport, one for the oceanic crossing, and then one for the arrival airport. There may even be more than that. Downloading these briefings and reading them is absolutely critical because we're covering general stuff today. We're looking at the entirety of Europe, right? There's many different countries involved. We can't give you all the specifics for every single country in 45 minutes. But what the pilot briefings do is it actually goes into your specific airport or the specific oceanic crossing for your oceanic sector and it explains exactly how to manage procedures. So those are the places to go for specifics and that should be absolutely required reading for anybody who's flying across the pond. I usually read the departure one before I go and I kind of skim the others and then while you're sitting there for nine hours <laughs> waiting for something to do, that's a great time to read the oceanic one, read the one about your arrival airport in a little bit more detail. So I'm going to hand things off to Dave David and Rob here in just a second, and they're going to go through the live presentation for the next 45 minutes. I start the clock as soon as I give it over to David. We'll be right on that 45 minutes. Following that, we will have time for as many questions as you have. So if you have questions, you can send them to me through the Flight Sim Association website if you're watching on there. And a big thanks to all of our FSA captains who are doing that and for supporting us. If you're watching anywhere else, pop a question in whatever chat you're looking at. Someone's going to send it my way. And if you're watching this, uh, the other place that you can ask questions, place that I happen to be looking, is on the VATSIM Cross the Pond Discord. So there's a Discord specifically for Cross the Pond, not the main Vatsim Discord, the Cross the Pond one. If you post a question in the community questions section there, I think I got that right, I will have a look at that as well, and I will do my best to feed those questions along. So wherever your questions are, send them to whomever, post them in the chat, we'll get them through to David and Rob, and we'll get them answered at the end of our live session. And my last comment, and it's so important that I have it spinning on the slide for you, this is not for real world <laughs> navigation, okay? This is for flight simulation. This is for VATSIM. Nothing we are going to tell you can or should be used in a real airplane. This is all for VATSIM, for fun, for learning, and for having a wonderful event when we have this all go down next yeah. weekend. So with that Pretend in mind... Sorry, Rob, say that again? Yeah, pretend pilots only. Yes, exactly. So with that in mind, I'm going to pass things over to you, David. I'm starting the 45-minute clock, and I'll be back with you when it's time for questions. But David, let's talk about Europe, the ocean, and then we'll hand things over to Rob for North America. <laughs> Thank you very much, Evan. I uh, appreciate it. Uh, yeah, so European operations, obviously, we'll start. Obviously, this is where you guys are going to be departing. Uh, mainly just going to be talking about some of the things that might be a bit different to what you're normally used to if you're you know, used to flying uh, in North America mainly altitudes, uh, but mainly just talking about what you need to do when you're requesting clearance, uh, you know, briefing your departure and uh, climb, uh, talking a bit about what you need to do in terms of pushback and taxi, and we'll also be talking a bit about CPDLC, uh, P uh, DCL, CPDLC as well, uh, through Hoppy, which some of you might have heard of. Uh, so yeah, let's just get into it. Uh, we'll start off with, um, well, something that is quite important, a uh, big difference uh, between European and uh, North American operations is the transition altitude. Um, so the transition altitude is when you are departing. Obviously, you know you need to be on the local Q and H, uh, local uh, Q and H, uh, the local pressure. Uh, but this is the altitude where you switch from the uh, local pressure to the standard pressure of Q and H one zero one three. The transition altitude in Europe depends from uh, on the airport that you're departing, and uh, you know it could be as low as three thousand, could be as you know as high as one one thousand, for example. Uh, this information can be found on the chart, specifically on the SID chart. For example, here it says, you know, you've got the Gatwick departure chart and uh, transition altitude 6,000 here. So you switch at 6,000 and transition altitude 3,000 here on this Amsterdam chart. So it's very important that you read the chart because the chart has all the information that you need. Transition level, uh, it's not too relevant. Transition level is when is you know, when you're arriving and, uh, you're switching from the standard pressure to the. Uh, local Q&H, uh, but that's obviously if you're arriving in Europe, most of you guys are going to be departing Europe. Um, so uh, we will just uh, move on to the next slide in that in that case. Initial climbs. Uh, so in Europe, it is quite common when you receive a clearance that ATC will not say anything about the altitude. They'll just give you a SID, they'll give you a squawk, and that's it. You're cleared. Uh, well, the initial climb it is, can most of the time can be found on the chart. Again, it's very important that you read the chart. Uh, for example, here it says, due to interaction with other routes, do not climb above 5,000 unless cleared by ATC. Initial climb clear is 4,000. Or over here, after departure, climb to flight level 6-0. So it's always, always check the SIDs. 
uh, and information that you can find there uh, in order to be fully briefed for your departure. Flight plan altitude is a very interesting topic. Uh, a lot of you have been asking, what flight level do I use for my cruise? What does this flight level mean? Uh, well, on the day, on cross the pond day, you will be assigned an altitude. This altitude is what you use only when you request oceanic clearance. And this is the altitude that you're supposed to be maintaining after you enter the ocean at the oceanic entry point. Before you do that, you still need to adhere to local procedures. So in Europe, uh, you'll be flying uh, uh, westbound. Uh, you know, it, uh, obviously you'll be departing and flying to the west. So you'll need to be maintaining an even altitude. Uh, in Spain and Portugal, it's a bit reversed. Uh, but uh, for as for the rest of the, the uh, Europe, uh, westbound means an even altitude. And you maintain that until you enter the ocean. Uh, requesting clearance. So when you're requesting clearance in Europe, you need to state a couple of uh, bits of information. First of all, your standing gate number. What gate are you at? Your aircraft type. What what flight, you know, what plane are you flying? Uh, the ATIS that you received and places like the UK also require to say the Q&H of the, uh, that you got from the ATIS. Uh, so for example, you know, Gatwick Delivery, Spirit 115 Heavy, Sun 513, Aircraft Type 787, uh, Information Golf, KNH 1023, Request Clearance to Newark. That's an example. Now, or you could use Hoppy, you, or you can also request the clearance through Hoppy P, uh, DCL, which we will get to uh, a bit later on. Uh, the reason there's an asterisk there is because, um, is because of the heavy. Uh, in Europe, uh, sorry, no, in North America, as uh, Rob uh, will be able to tell you guys, uh, later on, uh, the heavy is appended, uh, well, pretty much all the time, at least when you're flying in Tracons. Yep. Um, yeah. In Europe, you need to be appending the heavy only on, on initial contact, only when you're first talking to ATC. Uh, same goes if you're flying an A380, you know, you, you, you'll be speed of 115 super. You'll be seeing that, you'll be appending that heavy to, to call them only at the very beginning. Um, so we talked a bit about Hoppy, CPDLC or DCL. Uh, essentially in Europe, uh, you know, this is something that uh, most European facilities offer. What it is, if you guys haven't heard, is it stands for Controller Pilot uh, Data Link Communications, if I'm not mistaken. And it allows, you know, in busy situations, it allows uh, pilots to communicate with ATC through this uh, text. You can call it a text messaging service. It's a bit like SMS. Um, it works through VHF uh, automatically, or a or you know, uh, a cars or satellite communications. It depends depends where you are in the world. Uh, on VATSIM, we uh, European facilities do simulate Hoppy, CPD, LC, and DCL. Most of them do. Um, some aircraft do have direct integration built in uh, for CPD for Hoppy, CPD, LC. Uh, for example, the FS Labs A320 or the Innerbuilt A300 and A310. But if you're not flying one of those planes, that's completely fine. You can still use a program called Easy CPDLC. This is a program I strongly recommend you use. It's a program made by a, a one of our current controllers uh, that allows you, you know, it's a standalone program, and I will be uh, showing uh, that on the next slide. And uh, it will allow you to communicate with ATC using CPDLC and PDC through that little piece of software. So here's a little bit of a demonstration. You also you always need to know what the logon code is for the controller. In this case, you know I want to get the clearance from Canaris Control. You can also see in the remarks, you know the the logon code will always be in the remarks. In that case, it's Charlie Charlie Romy India. So we're going to go ahead and fire up CPDLC here. Uh, you know connect. There we go. My CPDLC is connected. So now when I'm requesting my clearance, I'm going to be clicking ATC and requesting a PDC. PDC DCL. That's your P departure clearance. The recipient is the logon code. So. Charlie, Charlie, Romeo, in, in that case, that's the controller. I need to double check that my call sign and aircraft type are set correctly. I'm requesting clearance to Newark. Uh, I'm at Tenerife right now. And uh, I have information alpha, as you can see. And uh, I'm on stand uh, Golf 2. Uh, in that next line, you can put any comments if you want. You know, if you need to add any comments whatsoever, uh, anything that you think uh, ATC should be aware of. Uh, and there we go. That's uh, the pre departure clearance has been sent. And as you can see, I've got a response already saying, uh, you know, the clearance has been received. And uh, it's being processed, and there we go. A few minutes later, you have the clearance. You can see there's a flashing uh, uh, arrows as well on the right. It means you need to interact with it. You need to respond to it. The clearance has all the details I need. You know, I'm clear to Newark, off runway 25, via the Iraq of three Fox for departure. I've got the squawk, I've got an altitude, and then I've got intentions. I'm happy with that clearance. I'm go going to go ahead and accept that clearance. I'm just going to add the response with Wilco. And uh, there we go. The clearance has been confirmed. And you have successfully, you know, it's as easy as that. Uh, you've successfully got your clearance now.
through PDC or DCL. Uh, moving on, uh, it's very important that you brief the departure before you actually push. You know, you need to be aware of uh, your departure, you know, what runway you're going to be departing, uh, as well as, you know, what you can expect, any potential nuances, you know, uh, what altitude you need to maintain, like we said before. Uh, any speed restrictions, maybe, you know, potential frequencies that you need to be aware of, terrain, weather, maybe. Um, so one tool that is very, very useful um, for charts, for grabbing your charts, obviously we do have many resources, but the one that we, pers you know, I personally recommend the most is called uh, uh, ChartFox. I will actually uh, quickly change my uh, display to show ChartFox. Uh, there it is. While you're while you're so, doing that, David, well, uh, just yeah. one thing about briefing. Like it's 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 some pilots find that weird. Some uh, sim pilots find that weird to say, "Well, who am I briefing? I'm I'm in here by myself." But you're you're briefing yourself. You're really you're thinking through the entire step of the of the entire flight before you execute it. Your brain needs to get there before your plane does. That's the old saying. Yeah, no, you definitely need. You know, it's kind of like revising for an exam. You need to be prepared for uh, what's going to hit you. Uh, Chartbox.org is available to any VATSA member. You can just log in on the top right, and then you can just put in an a care code of uh, an airport. Uh, let's, for example, say in my case, I want to depart. I'm going to depart, be departing Amsterdam. I'm going to put Amsterdam Echo Hotel Alpha Mike. Uh, and uh, well, there you can see I can easily open up any chart that I need. Uh, let's say I'm cleared on the Volo 3 Victor departure from runway 36 left. So I'll be opening the chart for runway 36 left. I can go ahead and uh, pin it. Uh, I don't actually know where that button is. I think it's this one. No, that isn't. Well, I can open it. I can open up a new page here um, to display the full chart. Uh, as you can see, Volo 3 Victor departure. I have all the information I need, the transition altitude, initial climb, any other instructions. Got the full departure here, you know, all the waypoints. We've got an altitude constraint over here. And uh, it's just very important that you brief what's on here. Over here, I can also open up uh, the taxi chart, you know, the aerodrome chart. Um, if that loads in, uh, I guess Norwegian internet is a bit... Uh, and not the best right now. Um, but yeah, you can you can basically open up all of the charts here. My point with this is this is a very, very useful resource. It's completely free to all Vatsum members. Chartbox.org, please use it uh, on the on the event. And uh, uh, yeah, controllers will uh, be happy with you if you do so. Uh, going back to my slides quickly. Uh, over to the next slide then. Um, climb instructions. So unlike in the in the US, in Europe, you might be getting a few uh, interesting climb instructions. Uh, I'm talking about the phraseology, of course. First of all, climb via SID, flight level 130 is a very, very common one. Uh, basically means that, you know, you need to climb to flight level 130. And whilst you're climbing, you need to be maintaining all of the, well, you need to be meeting all of the altitude restrictions and speed restrictions on the SID. Uh, next up, uh, sometimes ATC just might say climb to flight level 130, climb flight level 130. Essentially, by default, that means the same thing. You know, you just, uh, you know, you climb to meet all the published altitude and speed restrictions. Uh, there's an exception with the UK, which we'll talk about later. Um, sometimes uh, you will be told to climb unrestricted to climb flat, uh, to flat level 130. It's pretty self-explanatory. You just climb to flat level 130. You can disregard any uh, speed or altitude restrictions that you get. In the UK, you will hear the, uh, the phrase climb now flat level 130, which basically means the same thing. Uh, you climb now unrestricted to flight level 130. That's only a UK thing. Touch back and taxi. We're going to talk yes, about the, the, the descent instructions too and how they change between Canada and the US as well. But we'll get to, get to that in my portion. Oh, yeah. Yeah, no, it, it's, it's very similar and yet very different in the US, um, as you will find out. Uh, but when it comes to the pushback and taxi, uh, first of all, it's very important that you report ready for pushback and then just start on delivery frequency. So it's very important that you do not switch to ground uh, you know, as soon as you get your clearance, you stay with delivery frequency and you listen to all of the instructions uh, and comply with all the instructions that delivery gives you. Uh, some airports will use what's called uh, revised estimated times and target startup approval times. If I'm not going to go into full detail because we're a bit tight on time, but uh, essentially they're going to hold you on this, uh, you know, at your gate uh, until they have a spot for you to push. Uh, so, uh, you know, just stay there, stay and uh, if delivery tells you to stand by, stand by. And uh, yeah, you'll get it figured out with delivery. And again, when in doubt, ask. It's better that you always ask uh, someone uh, if you're unsure about something, then you do something that you weren't supposed to do. Uh, so always ask when in doubt. Uh, some phraseology uh, bits and pieces, uh, something that you might not be aware of, some differences. Uh, contact, you know, if you're told to, for example, connect tower on 118.5, 
you call with your call sign and, and location on the taxiway, pretty much. For example, you know, Skipple Tower, KLM 452 uh, on taxiway Victor. Contact with call sign only uh, is basically means the same thing, but when you switch, you only say your call sign. You don't even say tower. You switch and say KLM 452. You might even want to put a hello in there. I don't know. Up to you. Sometimes you'll be told to monitor, which means you switch to the frequency, but you don't say anything. Tower can see where you are. You can, they can see where you are, uh, that you're there, and they will call you up when they need to talk to you. Uh, you. In Portugal, for example, they will say standby on this on another frequency, which means the same thing. Monitor this frequency. Anyway, CPDLC kind of goes back to the whole hoppy thing. Uh, so CPDLC is also available once you climb and crew. Uh, once you, you know, once you're climbing, you switch to center frequency or ACC or control. Uh, it's offered at many European facilities, and the four-letter logon code will be found in the control remarks. For example, this controller has it in the you know, Brussels control. We've got the CPDLC code here. Same with Paris control, has the CPDLC code here. What's very important with CPDLC is that you always, always have to make an initial call on voice, because CPDLC is not a replacement to voice communications. You always need to be ready to respond via voice in case ATC calls you via voice. So a bit of a demo here uh, of me contacting, uh, connect, well, connecting to the Canaries controls, the uh, CPDLC, whilst I'm climbing out of uh, the, Canary, uh, the Canaries. You can see the login code is Charlie Charlie Romeo India, so I'm going to go ahead and uh, type in Charlie Charlie Romeo India as the login code. Um, and uh, momentarily, I will get, well, if you just look on the top right, you'll see that now the current ETC unit is now Charlie Charlie Romeo India, which means I'm successfully communicating with this controller through CPDLC. Uh, by the way, I have made the call already with ATC, um, so I don't have to check in with uh, uh, my call sign because I've done so already. Uh, so it says current ATC unit is Canaris Control, and in a second here I'll get a climb instruction of 3CPDLC. There we go. Climb to flat level 360. That's, a, that's an instruction. I need to respond to it. I can either say I'll, I'll comply, I'm unable, or I can do something else. But in this case, I'm fully able to climb to flat level 360, so I'm just going to put that in, and it's as simple as that. I'm uh, just going to pause it here because we don't have too much time left. We were initially supposed to trim this. Uh, but through this little window here as well, you can make a bunch of other requests if you want to fly direct, if you want a different flight level. Uh, you can make those requests through CPDLC. You can find out more about that when you download the software. Uh, moving on, uh, en route altitude changes. In Europe, North America, anywhere, altitude, uh, you know, anywhere, uh, you always need to request ATC clearance for if you want to change your flight plan. If, if your FMS tells you to step climb, if your optimal flight level changes, uh, if your cleared level in, in the oceanic clearance is different to your current level, which is very important. Uh, that's basically, you know, your when you when you get your oceanic clearance, the level might be a bit different to um, what you're currently at. So you need to you need to talk to ATC about changing that 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 level. Or you know, if you hit your top of descent, if you don't get any other instructions, you need to request clearance. Or you know, if your cat jumps on the keyboard and changes your altitude selector. Request ATC clearance first. Very important that you do that. Um, that's going to be it in terms of European operations. If you have any questions about that, obviously drop those questions in the, in the chat or wherever, and uh, we can get to those at the end of the uh, webinar. Uh, but oceanic operations, we're just going to be talking about some of the different facilities, uh, how domestic and oceanic is different uh, to uh, uh, you know, well, how oceanic is different to domestic. We'll be talking about oceanic clearances and NAT track, which is what you'll be using. Uh, we'll be talking about entering oceanic airspace and position reports. We're not going to be talking too much about those, uh, but mainly just where to use those. Uh, so oceanic facilities, these are some of the main facilities that you are, are going to be interacting with. So Reykjavik, Shanwick, Gander, New York, Santa Maria, and Piarco as well. Uh, so that's more or less what those look like. Um, Lat long waypoints. So uh, when you enter oceanic airspace, most waypoints are going to, I'm not going to be standard five uh, letter waypoints like Mallot, for example. Uh, they're actually just going to be physically lateral and longitudinal degree waypoints. For example, you could get this route, Mallot 54 North 020 West, etc. The way you put it in in your MCDU, in this case, uh, over the Atlantic, is you put 5420 North, which means 54 North 020 West. And you pronounce it. 54 North 020 West. So you could have 5420 North, which is what you put in your F FMC, or 6015 North. Again, that's what you put in your FMC or MCDU. Use of cell cal. So cell cal is a very, very crucial part of HF radio. Uh, essentially, when you're flying over the ocean in real life, um, HF is unsquelched. Uh, so which means you've always got the static disturbance uh, sound 
Um, and if you listen to it for hours, you might just go crazy. Uh, luckily, CellCal is uh, uh, there to the rescue. CellCal is uh, connected. To, uh, so each aircraft has like a four-letter cell, uh, cell call code. Each letter corresponds to a specific tone. And uh, on a nature frequency, ATC can then play this tone on the frequency. And then the aircraft will detect that, oh, okay, this is my cell call code. And they're going to alert the pilot crew that, uh, hello, there's a cell call um, alert or cell call ping uh, coming up to your aircraft. You better call ATC. Um, the thing about cell call is when you're maintaining cell call watch after you've done your cell call check, you can completely turn down your HF radio, right? So you don't need to be talking, you know, you, you don't have to be listening to HF if you don't want to, but, uh, you know, you can just turn down the volume as long as you stick to, you know, you, you don't change frequencies. And as long as you, you are able to respond to the cell call ping once you get back. Uh, another thing about cell call is you have to use the cell call code that's provided to you in your booking. It's very, very important that you do so, uh, because... You know, you could be flying one, uh, many pilots could be flying the same livery. So it's very, so in order to make sure that no cell calls overlap, use the same, just use a cell call that is in your booking. So what is the process of getting your oceanic clearance? Well, first of all, oceanic clearance is required before you enter oceanic airspace and it's designed to provide separation for the entire oceanic crossing in case there's a communication failure, in case there's an HF failure. The oceanic clearance is valid throughout the entire oceanic uh, crossing, so it could span for many FIRs, many oceanic FIRs. And the steps are, you know, you need to require, gather, first of all, gather the required info. So what you need is your routing. You need to know what route you're going to be flying. Uh, your ETA for the oceanic entry point, the requested flight level for your oceanic crossing. So again, going back to the point that we initially made, this is the level um, that will be on the pilot dashboard for Cross the Pond. Uh, you're also going to be looking at the maximum flight level. Uh, so essentially, you know, what's the highest you can climb and maintain whilst you're in, uh, well, after you enter the ocean. And the speed as well, you know, what speed you want to maintain once you enter the ocean. These details can be found in your MCDU. So you can see I've got the entry point. I've got the ETA for my entry point here. I've got my speed here. And I've got my uh, recommended maximum flight level here as well. Um, so... These are, you know, these correspond here. And then one and three, obviously, you know, the routing and the request of flight level, you get those from the pilot dashboard. Uh, so then once you have all of those details, you will need to go on the NatTrack website. So all oceanic clearances will be done through the NatTrack website. This is nattrack.batsum.net. So you will, all of you with a slot will have to request oceanic clearance with, through this NatTrack website. Try to do, do it about 30, 60 minutes before you enter the ocean. And uh, however, if you're departing close to oceanic airspace, for example, from Lisbon, Dublin, or, Te or Tenerife, you need to do so as soon as you can. Um, it's pretty self-explanatory with the screenshots, but you know, you put your call sign and all of the other details uh, on the NatTrack website. Uh, I'm not sure if you guys can see, but uh, the page is going to look something like this uh, with all of the details here that you can put in. And uh, this is an example of what it might look like when you get your oceanic clearance. So this is kind of like a CPDLC replacement of what you would get in real life through CPDLC. But here it just, you know, here it tells you what the clearance will be in human terms. Uh, so this is your full clearance. Uh, note in this one, you, you have the change Mach number, change flight level. So it will tell you if any of those change. If you have any issues with that track, maybe you haven't received your clearance, you know, maybe there's something that is wrong. Talk to your domestic controller because your domestic controller is your key contact to... Um, Oceanic, you know, they will be, be able to talk to Oceanic and whoever's responsible, and they will be able to help you out. Maybe they'll give you another frequency to contact. Maybe they, they'll be able to set to tell you the Oceanic clearance. Uh, but yeah, in terms of entering Oceanic airspace, the most important thing to do is initiate a circle check. Uh, so, uh, Rob, if you just want to go ahead and we're be gonna, a small example play this. To me. Okay, sure. Oh, yeah, yeah. and you, you, you made me a heavy version too. What are you trying to say? <laughs> <laughs> All right, Shamwick Radio, Shamwick Radio, version 127 Heavy, Gander next, requesting cell count check on Alpha Juliet Echo Sierra. Uh, version 127, Shamwick Radio, Roger. Stand by for cell count check. So it's pretty much as simple as that. Uh, you get a cell call ping, you have to respond with cell call check okay. And from that, that moment, on, your moment on, you're assuming uh, you assume does uh, maintaining cell call watch, and you can turn down your HF volume, uh, but you need to be ready to respond to a cell call ping. Uh, also, it's very important that you don't switch frequencies without uh, you know authorization. You have to stay on that frequency until uh, you're told to switch to another frequency. Um, each time you switch to a new frequency, conduct a new cell call check. So if I'm flying from Shanwick to Gander, for example, and I get switched to a Gander frequency, I need to be doing a new cell call check on Gander Shanwick's frequency. 
Um, one little thing, well, one little note as well. You need to be squawking 2,030 minutes after you enter Oceanic Airspace. So keep the squawk, uh, but then you can squawk 2,030 yeah, minutes after you enter. That's the one I forget all the time. <laughs> oh, yeah. Every time. I think I in real life, a lot of pilots forget them as well. Yeah. <laughs> so um, conditional frequency changes very quickly. Sometimes you might be asked to change to another frequency at a specific location. For example, Virgin 127 at 30 West, call Gander Radio 131. That's more 575. Which means at the 30 West longitude point, you need to be switching to this new frequency. Some controllers simulate, simulate it or ransom, some don't, but just be prepared to do so and be, you know use caution. Don't do it immediately, do it when you cross 30 West. Yeah. That's gonna be it for me. Yeah, that's gonna be it for me. Think uh, I'm gonna be going, I'm gonna go ahead and pass it over to Rob now, who's gonna be talking about North American operations. All right. Thank you, David. Uh, yeah, so we have a lot of information to cover. Not quite as much as David had to cover, but we have a lot of information to cover here for North American operations. We're going to talk about the descent preparation. We're going to talk about uh, the descent instructions that you may get coming into North America, and we're going to talk about approach and landing. Now, one thing Evan mentioned earlier, and I'll come back to, though, is that there are two arrival, I think two, maybe three, arrival airports that are in the Caribbean that are not in North America, so they're not covered by what I'm about to say. And the, the, the identifiers for those starts with a T as in tango. Um, but if you're arriving into North America, then you know a lot of what's covered here is going to be, uh, to be pertinent to you. Now, like I said, I am going to cover quite a bit, but if you only remember three things from what I'm about to say, these are the three things that we need you to kind of take away and remember. Number one is in North America, you do not need to report once you're established on the localizer. Trust us, the radar controllers are watching you and that they will see that you're established on the localizer. So you don't need to tell them they're already going to be very, very busy on frequency. So it's just an extra transmission that's not needed. They will be, they'll be aware that you're established on the localizer when they see you. Um, Number two is that you never start a descent without authorization. I think David kind of touched on this as well. Um, I, I bring it up again because it's especially in the Boeing style uh, FMCs, they love to throw you that little warning if you're coming up on your, your calculated top of descent and you get that little warning that says reset MCP altitude. Well, that's a very helpful reminder, but it, 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 it omits the fact that you do need to have clearance to do that. You can't just lower it on your own because the FMC told you to. You do need to make sure that you've gotten that descent clearance from your controller. And then third, uh, and I know David did talk about the transition altitudes and transition levels in Europe as you depart and that the transition levels are different uh, dep depending on the airport sometimes and depending on the weather that day sometimes for some of them. Uh, in the U.S., we've got it easy. It's flight level 180. Uh, all day, every day, 24-7, 365. So as soon as you come down through 18,000 or flight level 180, you're now back into A, local altimeters, uh, and and uh, B, referring to altitudes as as uh, thousands and hundreds of feet. So it's it's often odd for European pilots to say 17,000 instead of flight level 170. But on the North American side, we don't have a flight level 170. And again, it's just it's not just how you say it, but it's the fact that you have to have the altimeter calibrated to local. Um, they always say for word descent prep uh, that a good landing starts with a good approach and a good approach starts with a good briefing. Well, what do we mean briefing? Um, it just basically means, like I said earlier, preparing yourself for the next steps of the flight before you actually execute them. You can check the ATIS, and you don't have to wait until you're in radio range. This is something that a lot of VATSIM pilots don't know. You don't have to wait for the ATIS to pop up in the controller list. You can type .ATIS and the name of the ATIS station, uh, or you can check it via um, via that spy or some of the other online uh, activity monitoring tools. So there's ways that you can get that ATIS ahead of time and be extra prepared, especially like we said, in these longer oceanic sectors, you definitely want to waste, don't want to waste that time. You want to spend that time um, preparing for the next steps of your flight. In that ATIS, it should tell you which landing runway we're going to be using, or if not, it will at least tell you which landing direction the airport is operating in. Uh, with airports that have multiple parallels, which many of our arrival airports do, you might not know exactly which runway you're going to use, but you'll at least know the operating direction. Well, I recommend just go ahead and pick what what run one runway you think is the most likely that you're going to get, and just go ahead and brief that all the way through the approach, even if even before you start your descent. Uh, that way, if you get lucky and that's the one that you get assigned, you're already ahead of the game. And if you don't get lucky, then it's only the approach portion that you have to rebrief uh, in order to get yourself up to speed on what you've been assigned. Um, but everything else you have already kind of done. 
um, with you have the star, you definitely want to compare what's on the chart. And we'll talk about star charts here coming up in a bit. But you want to compare the star chart and make sure that all of the waypoints uh, imported properly and not only the uh, waypoints themselves, but the restrictions that are listed at each waypoint. So here we've got uh, the point Cleb, that's at 8,000 feet and 250 knots. So you want to make sure that that is indeed represented in the FMC. And then, of course, you got Huck Du up further uh, north. That's 5,210 knots. And yeah, you want to make sure that those are uh, listed in the FMC properly as well. And then the uh, kind of last but not least thing, oh, yeah, with the approach, you want to check the, the radio frequencies and the minimums. Of course, you really want to do a more thorough approach briefing, but I guess the, um, you know, the radio frequency and the minimums are kind of the more important numbers to keep in mind. Um, but uh, so you certainly want to look at that. And then uh, once you've uh, determined your landing runway, you want to look at the taxiway chart. Again, you're, you're not done flying until you're at the gate. So you uh, want to make sure you've, you've briefed every portion of that flight, including the taxi in. And you might not know exactly the taxi route that you're going to take, but you should be, at least be able to get a sense of what to expect there. Um, you you might you often won't know exactly what gate. You won't have a uh, you want a specific gate assignment, but you can at least figure out what terminal you're going to park at, and uh, so that should give you a pretty good sense of the taxi route that you're going to take. And then if you get something slightly different than what you're expecting, at least you have seen that chart and you kind of have uh, a familiar sense of what other taxiways are around there so it won't be um you know completely unexpected you'll you'll be able to roll with it all right let's talk about yeah, the descent no, instruction um, okay david yeah i just wanted to quickly say you know when i'm you know i even controlling uh both in vatsim and also when i'm listening in in real life as well you will have a lot of uh, a lot of the time controller you know after you vacate controllers will ask you say gate or say parking you know they will right. want you to know where you're parking uh, so yeah. you need to be ready to respond and you need to be ready to know at least, if not the gate, but, you know, what terminal you're going to. You need yeah, to be terminal, ready to any, Anywhere in yeah. Terminal 4 is fine or something like that, but at least have exactly, something prepared yeah. to say so know where you're, where you're supposed to park. And it doesn't have yeah. to be where that real airline actually parks in the real world, but, you know, most pilots like to do that, but it doesn't really necessarily have to be. You can say uh, whatever's closest or whatever, but just have an answer prepared instead of, uh, I don't know. <laughs> Anyway, so let's talk about the descent instructions because they are a little bit different in Canada versus the United States. And there's two kind of different prevailing philosophies as to how the descent instructions work. We'll start with Canada. And in Canada, the prevailing philosophy is that all of the intermediate altitude and speed restrictions apply unless you're specifically told they don't. And we're going to contrast that in a little bit to the way the U.S. does it. But in Canada, pretty much assume that all of these intermediate instructions, these intermediate restrictions, altitude and speed are going to apply unless you're specifically told otherwise. So in this first example, you've got uh, descend 11000. You might hear descend to 11000 or a lot of controllers omit the word to there, which is not technically required. So descend 11000. Um, so you can, you, know, you will, in, in that case, you just start that descent pretty immediately. So descend, it, it's equivalent to descend now or descend and maintain in the U.S. Uh, but you just start that descent immediately upon receiving the instruction and acknowledging it. Um, but in Canada, you do have to maintain that intermediate instruction. So Lirat will still be between 15 and 17,000, and you still have to slow to two, uh, 250 knots as you cross that point. Um, then the other thing is, obviously, you have to get to Dunop by one one thousand or before you know, arrive at one one thousand before you get to Dunop or, or by the time you get to Dunop. Um, this is a, a little bit different. This is when ready descend one one thousand. This is uh, dis equivalent to descend pilot's discretion, as as you'd hear it in the U.S. But in in the Canada, you hear when ready descend one one thousand. Uh, however, again. That does still mean that even though you can start the descent at your discretion, you still have to start it in in, in time to get to fifteen to seventeen thousand when passing Lirat, and you do need to slow to two fifty there. And then once you get down to uh, Dunop, uh, again it's eleven thousand by the time you get there. You might hear uh, an, an instruction that says cross Dunop at ten thousand. That that is a crossing restriction that applies to that point. And you'll notice in this example. It's not what's on the chart. It's a different restriction than what's what's on the chart. So the controller's instruction overrides that 11,000 at Dunup. However, the uh, restrictions at Lirat still do apply in this case. So 15 to 17 and 250 knots at Lirat. And then once you get to Dunup, you need to be at 10,000 or 10,000. This is the finally the one where you will be specifically told that the restrictions do not apply. You will hear it in terms of descend unrestricted 8,000. 
Uh, and again, the, the 8,000 might be lower than any of the charted restrictions here. That's just um, the, the controller always has the option to override for whatever operational necessity they are dealing with. So if they need you lower than what's on the chart, they will sell, they will tell you and they will say it in terms of descend unrestricted to that altitude. And the charted altitudes and speeds do not apply in that case because you've heard that word unrestricted. So those restrictions are then canceled. Now, in the U.S., it's kind of the different uh, thing. We, we kind of will tell you if we want you to follow the restrictions on the star, we will tell you. So the most one of the more common instructions that you get is a descend via, descend via the Ocean 5 arrival. Uh, and in fact, you'll get that oftentimes with a, um, a, a tailing transition uh, instruction. In this case, Ocean 5 arrival runway 27. Some airports, you'll hear it you know, descend via the, the hyper whatever arrival, airport landing north, airport landing south, airport landing east. So that gives you an idea that basically tells you that your, your star has multiple forks at some point ahead. And so for us to give you a proper descent instruction, we've got to tell you which of those forks you'll be taking once you get to that point. It's not a runway assignment, but it's an assignment of the path that you're taking to the runway. So you do start the descent at your discretion at whatever point you or your FMC has calculated is the optimal top of descent point to get you to those uh, that that uh, to these restrictions along the path. You do need to meet all the published altitude restrictions and the speed restrictions along the path and descend down to the lower lowest altitude that's published on the particular transition or fork that you are taking and in this case it's a b at six thousand so this is where you can lower that that mode control panel altitude and you would lower it down to six thousand and if you're following it if you have a plane that's got a good vertical navigation it's going to hit all these restrictions along the way for you although you do need to make sure you need to monitor and make sure that it is doing so um, but yeah you'd lower that to six thousand once you get this descend via instruction if you get something different, it might say, uh, you know, you might hear descend and maintain one one thousand. That's equivalent to descend now or descend uh, unrestricted in the U.S. Again, if we don't say descend via the star, we are not telling you to uh, follow the altitude restrictions on the star. However, one really strange case in the U.S. is that the speed restrictions do still apply. So you've now been given a different altitude clearance that says descend and maintain one one thousand but the speed restrictions have not been changed. And so the speed restriction at ocean does still count. You don't have to worry about 10,000 at Euro. You don't have to worry about the altitudes at ocean. Uh, you don't have to worry about the altitudes at AB until you're given a later instruction. Um, but once you pass ocean, you do, need, do still need to slow down to 250 knots at that point. That's just an, a unique, kind of a unique case, the way the uh, altitude and speed restrictions are kind of considered separately in the US. Uh, descend at pilot's discretion to maintain one one thousand. Uh, and, and again, it's the same thing. It's the uh, the pilot can start down when they choose, or when the FMC or when the the pilot has determined this is the best top of descent to reach uh, one one thousand by the desired point. And the charted altitudes along the path do not apply, but that charted speed still does. Two five zero at ocean. Now, uh, in this example, cross ocean that and maintain eight thousand. So again, we've canceled the restriction of, of, of the altitudes at Euro and at Ocean. Uh, you can start that descent whenever you feel is optimal to, to make 8,000 by Ocean, but indeed that speed restriction again still does apply. Again, because the altitude restriction is, is what the controller gave you. The altitude clearance is what the controller gave you that overrides uh, the altitudes, but it does not override the speeds. Um, there's some different ways in Canada and the U.S. that you'll see altitudes and speed restrictions listed on the on the charts. Uh, here's an example from a Canadian star chart where you have the altitude and speed restrictions listed in bold there with the lines uh, above and below, meaning that you must be exactly at that altitude. In the U.S., we have it uh, listed like that as well. We don't have the box around it. The green box has been added for clarification. Uh, but you'll see the, the restriction is listed at a certain waypoint, so at SOBA. Uh, at or above 15,000 there. What we don't want to do is be looking at these minimum en route segments uh, altitudes. They are they are there. They're they're important, but they're not important for uh, for the purpose of a descend via clearance. So uh, you know many pilots get confused by those and they think that they might need to be down to you know 1,600 or whatever by Ayana. That's not the case. So the ones that are sideways along the line segments, uh, I, I'll I'll say for for purposes of this discussion, ignore those. 
they're important in other contexts, but ignore those for this context and focus on the ones that are listed right by the name of the waypoint. Those are the ones that you want to look at. And then last but not least is, uh, is a star where you have an expected altitude rather than a firm restriction. So in contrast to where Soba is listed at 15,000 on the ocean, here's the part from Kennedy, which is an expected altitude. Expect to cross 12,000 and 250 knots. However, that expectation is not a firm instruction until the controller says cross Calverton, Charlie, 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 at and maintain 12,000 and 250 knots. This chart at least allows you to plan ahead of time. And the, the good reason for that is you can, you can put that into your FMC as a crossing restriction of 12,000 at Calverton, and that will calculate that optimal top of descent point. If you don't put that in, it might calculate a top of descent that's too late in order for you to be down there in time. Um, so it does help for planning purposes that you can put 12,000 at Calverton in. Just know that once you're given that instruction, if it's different than 12, they might need you at 13, they might need you at 14 if they've got other cr uh, aircraft crossing that same point around the same time as you. So they're keeping vertical separation that way, but, um, but you'll need to go back and change it. But it's still not a, a firm instruction until you hear the controller say it. Now, what happens when you get to the end of the star? There's a, a few different cases here get to the end of the star, um, you'll see in some cases expect radar vectors uh, after LaGuardia. In, in this case, it says after LaGuardia. In some cases, it'll say expect radar vectors prior to such and such point. The controller can really break you off of that. It's called breaking you off of the star. They're going to give you a heading that then cancels the rest of the lateral portion of the star. So at that point, once you're told fly heading one net or zero vectors to final, it doesn't matter where you are. Did you make it to LaGuardia? Did you not make it to LaGuardia? It doesn't matter. Um, if the chart says expect, you've just now gotten something that you didn't expect, which was a vector prior to LaGuardia, but that's fine. Um, once you're given that vector, you turn, uh, you're not, you're not waiting to, to cross LaGuardia and then turn unless that's what you were instructed to do. A fly heading one nine or zero means to do it now. Um, this is the, the kind of the different instruction or the different configuration of a star that pil pilots do kind of, uh, not they don't always get this one right because this is a case where the star kind of ends and it ends in this kind of instruction where you just kind of keep going in this direction and there's a tendency i think when you when you as a pilot put your star in and then you put your approach in there's a tendency that the fmc is going to throw you a discontinuity which means there's not the route doesn't connect it's it's, it's not an error message it's just a warning it says hey your route doesn't connect here um so it's, uh, but it's important to leave that discontinuity in there because you'll notice at the bottom of this, at the very bottom, it says uh, you, pa you pass Joby at 6,000 and 210 on track 213, and then you maintain that on track 213, expecting radar vectors to the final approach course. So you can't turn, you basically, you stay straight on till morning, as, this, as the arrow says, straight on till morning, Peter Pan here. Uh, you don't uh, turn toward the beginning of the approach until you are specifically told to. And that's what a lot of pilots do, again, because they've taken out that discontinuity and they've connected those two points in their FMC. Here's an example of what that looks like and why. Um, the discontinuity is over on the left-hand side. You see there's the, the boxes and there's the little instruction that says vectors and there's a tendency for pilots to want to drag that point, uh, um, what is it, uh, Cavi, and stick it up into where the vectors is so that it connects the path between Jordan and Cavi. Well, that's not what you want to do because the plane is then going to pass Jordan and then start heading directly to Cavi. Well, when, when you do that, you've now cut off the plane that is already on that approach coming down that path, that, that final pass. So you're now turning basically directly into their path, which is kind of what a controller is, is, is trying to avoid. So um, leave that discontinuity in there and uh, you know don't make that turn onto your approach until you're told to. All right, let's uh, move on to a checklist for flying across the pond. And, and uh, as I, we've mentioned before, I've flown in, uh, I think I've, I've participated in eight of these and six of them I've flown in. Um, so uh, here's a, a, a decent checklist for what you need to be prepared for. I definitely strongly, uh, I won't say recommend, I mandate that you <laughs> read the pilot briefings. Uh, they're not yet published over on uh, ctp.batsim net just yet but real soon within the next week uh, a pilot briefing for each departure airport and each 
arrival airport will be published at that ctp.vatsin.net website. So uh, I strongly, uh, again, uh, mandate that you go over there and read those cover to cover prior to the uh, event day. Uh, the, the pilot briefing is often going to have recommendations for which freeware and payware sceneries you can install that will improve the, not only the look of the airport, but it might uh, update the layout to current, you know, at air, airports, taxiway layouts change sometimes, sometimes default scenery is slightly misaligned from real world um, alignments of, of gates and such. So you're going to sh be shown kind of somewhat off from where the gate is that you're actually parked at. And you'll be parked in a line of planes that are all off and you're wondering why you're sitting there by yourself. Um, but it might be that your scenery, your default scenery might be slightly misaligned and there might be some sort of freeware or payware add on that has a that has the terminal aligned a little bit more uh, correctly. So definitely read through those briefings and get that uh, get that scenery installed ahead of time. In fact, spawn in and test and make sure that it, it installed properly. Uh, routing is real easy for Cross the Pond. People panic about, well, where am I going to find all this information about the net tracks and the routes and how do I how do I put a route together? Well, for crossing um, crossing the ocean on a regular day on VATSIM, yes, that's a very complicated process. For Cross the Pond, it's easy as pie because all you got to do is check your email. They're going to send the route the night before and you just basically just plug that route in. Do you need to, to uh, uh, pull the charts up for that route? So if there's a specific SID, a specific star, um, you know, you definitely want to have those charts uh, uh, in advance. You want to have uh, looked at those. You, once you get your arrival runway figured out or, or what you expected arrival runways figured out, you want to pull the approach chart. Um, you want to pull the airport diagrams for both your origin and your destination so that when you're given taxi instructions, you, you have a sense of, of what letters are going to be where. So you have a, a, a preconceived idea of what letters you are expecting to hear in that uh, instruction. Definitely want to pack extra fuel. You want to plan for not having the most fuel efficient altitude. Again, this is going to be a very, very busy, very packed airspace. It's no guarantee whatsoever that they'll be able to accommodate your plane's optimal cruise altitude. In fact, it's almost a guarantee that they won't. So definitely bring extra fuel expecting not to be quite as efficient as on a normal day. And then also plan for some additional time for holds or, uh, or for vectors for traffic or, or whatever else that they have to do to maintain the, um, the sequence of these thousand or so pilots that are going to be crossing the ocean at the same time. Um, this instruction is a, a good guideline if there's not something in the pilot briefing that gives you contrary information. If you um, if you don't have anything in that pilot briefing, then a good guideline for when you should connect to the network would be about 45 minutes before your your CTOT, your uh, calculated takeoff time. So that's your slot time, and it's in terms of when you go wheels up off the runway. Um, so about 45 minutes before that CTOT is when you want to connect to the network, and then about 20 minutes prior to um, CTOT is when you want to push. However, the pilot briefing that we mentioned earlier, which you've already read cover to cover because I told you it was mandatory, um, might have different figures for that. Um, I think David, you were saying that, uh, you know, like yeah. between one, one, one uh, location and another, like what was the Yeah, no, you definitely, used? you know, for, for those, for, for the big European airports, you definitely have to take into account the size of the airport. You know, if you're yeah. departing Gatwick or maybe, you know, Tenerife or Dublin, they're, gonna, they're not as big of a, uh, airports, uh, you know, they're yeah. not, as big as, for example, you know, you could have Paris Charles de Gaulle or Schiphol, where you could be taxiing for ages and ages and mm, ages. Yeah, Bear yeah. If you're that in mind, Amsterdam, when you're, pushing, you're going to be yeah. driving almost as long as you're going to be oh, flying. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, so exactly. you definitely want to go by the guidelines that are in that pilot briefing. Yeah. However, if there's no um, th there's no connection time guidelines, then 45 minutes prior to CTOT and 20 minutes to push um, is a, is a good guideline to go off of. Again, defer to those pilot briefings that'll be up on the ctp.vatsin.net website. Um, finally, we definitely want to limit the use of text. Um, if you, if you are a person that needs to use text, obviously that is fine. But if you are, um, if you're just, if you're trying to get in a word edgewise on a very busy frequency and you're using text to, uh, to try and just get the controller's attention, don't do that. Stay on voice. Uh, do most of your voice community, you know, your, your ATC communications by voice because that's what everyone else is doing. And the, and the controller has that way has one less source of things that they've got to, uh, to manage uh, as they're trying to control the very, very busy, probably the busiest event day that they that they control in the, in the course of a year. So again, don't, don't try and jump the line by using text. Just uh, be patient get your word in when you can and uh, stay on voice with everybody else. Uh, again, unless there's some reason that you have to use text. 
Um, like CPDLC, last but not, for example. Uh, right, yeah, CPL, uh, DC notwithstanding, but uh, yeah. but for general ATC communications, specifically on you know ground taxi and uh, anything in the terminal environment, it's all going to be on voice uh, for the most part. And uh, and then pay attention, keep distractions to a minimum. Um, it's uh, you know in the real world below ten thousand feet. The rule is a sterile cockpit, meaning that you eliminate all distractions. As we fly as uh, sim pilots, we tend to have the live stream going. We tend to have the music going, everything else going on. Um, but pay attention. Listen out for that call sign. And specifically, if it's a call sign that you don't fly with uh, ordinarily, uh, what I recommend and what real-world pilots often do is they write down the call sign on a piece of masking tape and stick it somewhere on, on the, the glare screen or, or up on your monitor or somewhere. Fold it, you know, put, fold it on an index card and set it right in front of your monitor or something. Uh, so that you'll see that call sign and, and hopefully we'll be listening out for it and we'll respond to it. Not the third time, not the second time, but the first time the controller issues it. Uh, the, the, the other thing that I'll mention is on, on Cross the Pond, you really want to go with the flow and just you proceed in line with everybody else as best as you can. You don't want to be the person that's got all kinds of special requests. You're not going to, this isn't the day that you want to request a different route or request a different time or request, you know, other kind of changes to your flight plan. Um, there are legitimate needs that, uh, that you'll need to contact controllers for to change altitudes, of course. Uh, and you will have to change from your, uh, your domestic crews to your oceanic crews, but you should limit any other requested altitude changes as much as possible. The one thing that you should do, though, is to stop and ask for a repeat of something that you didn't understand or didn't hear. Um, the extra workload that you're going to add with a special request is, is, again, it's not the right day for it. The extra workload that you're going to add to have them repeat something that you didn't understand is less than the extra workload that you cause somebody by being given an instruction and then failing to follow it. So definitely, you do want to be that person when it comes to asking for a repeat if there was something that you didn't quite catch or didn't quite understand. So again, you're going to, you're going to cause less additional workload by doing that than by, uh, than by doing something other than what you were told to do. All right. So this is a list of some additional resources. A lot of these were very instrumental in uh, preparing myself to fly my first cross the pond five years ago. Uh, so here's a, a good uh, list of resources for you. And I think uh, at this point, I'm going to go ahead and turn things back over to Evan. Oh, and isn't that great timing because it is now just past 19 GMT. So if you're somebody who doesn't have a cross the pond slot, you're probably massively uh, refreshing that booking page right this yes. second because this is your chance to get one. And very soon, the ability to trade slots, drop slots, pick up people's slots, that's all going to happen. So if you're somebody who's really hoping to fly in this event, now is your chance to go and do that. And now is also our time to answer questions. So Rob and David, phenomenal presentation. Thank you guys so much for putting this all together and for the rehearsals that we did and for all the work that has gone <laughs> on behind the scenes. Hopefully everyone who's here enjoyed that. And a big thank you as well to all of the moderators who've helped in putting this on at FS elite vat usa vat can vats in spain gander oceanic i'm sure i'm missing a few in there as well of both of your channels of course big thanks to everyone who's been able to do this i saw london controller on the vats in twitch as well and you may not know this jamie but one of our traditions in the other cross the pond the eastbound one is that once we've sent all the traffic to europe we go and look at streams of you controllers handling all the arrivals including last year like vats in <laughs> scandinavia was in like a real control tower do you guys remember that it was crazy yeah, they were they were doing like a thirty six hour event there non stop in the Helsinki. So yeah, yeah, good, yeah, good stuff. Really so cool. uh, we're going to answer some questions in a couple moments. I know some people may decide that if their questions have been answered, they don't have any questions, they're going to jump off. So just before you go, I want to just do a couple more things that we're going to get into those questions. First of all, uh, Rob and David, you guys obviously have put this together, total volunteer, just like the rest of us here. But if people wanted to support you, how can they do that? How can they follow you? So Rob, maybe you can go first and then David. Yes, well, absolutely. Um, and thank you very much for Evan for, for your part in putting this all together and all the marketing work. And of course, you're the, the behind the scenes director of this thing as the as we were going through it as well so thank you for an excellent job and for a great presentation in that regard so yes if, if guys if you uh if you liked what you saw um you know i, I think evan didn't you say you had you have a survey there at the bottom of the screen or? yes we do so uh flight okay. sim association.com slash survey would be a great place for people to go to if you can just take a moment tell us what you thought one to five rating and then any comments 
thoughts, things we can do differently. Gotcha. Obviously, we'd love to do this for every cross the pond. We could do it again at eastbound. We could do it again <laughs> at westbound. I think it's great reminders. So if people liked it, please tell us. If you didn't like it, please tell us that as well, and we'll blame Rob. Yes. And if you did, yes. And if you did like it, then my name is Rob from Slant Alpha Adventures. And if you didn't like it, my name is Sim Caesar. <laughs> <laughs> and then, David, how can people find you and, and tell us a little bit more about what you're doing when you're on Twitch and when you're on the network? Uh, the truth is, I don't stream too often these days now. Uh, I do hardly find uh, the time to do so. Uh, but when I do stream, I typically stream control. You know, typically, I'm typically controlling something. Uh, maybe I'll be doing a 24 hour stream sometime or another again. Uh, my Twitch is twitch.tv uh, slash uh, D Solisvik. So D and then my surname Solisvik. Uh, but if you know, if you just want to talk to me, yeah, you can find me on Discord. I'm in a lot of Discord servers. If you want to talk to me, you know, my, you can probably find my Discord there. Uh, ping me and I'll be happy to answer any questions. And uh, yeah, obviously, you can obviously check out our uh, resources with Gander Oceanic, which are uh, listed here as well if you want to find out more, any more information about Oceanic. Perfect. And of course, a big thank you to all of our Flight Simulation Association captains who are watching today. You guys make stuff like this possible. So thank you all for the subscription support. We certainly appreciate it. If anyone wants a copy of the slides, obviously there's a lot of links on the screen. It's hard to write those all down. There's only one link you need to remember. If you go to bit.ly slash ctp22w, so bit.ly cross the pond 22 westbound that will give you a link to all of the resources i've got all those links included in the description and if you'd like to download a copy of the slides from today that is also where you can find that on that same link is where a replay will be available if you missed anything you want to go back and watch it again it'll be up there i'm sure lots of the youtube channels that we're simulcasting on will also have that and if anyone from vatsim or anyone else wants the slides so they can host them let me know and i'm obviously happy to share those with you so with that in mind uh, i think we'll go into some questions are you guys ready Absolutely. Yeah, let's do yeah. it. All right. So I'm going to start with a couple of questions about oceanic clearances and position reports, stuff that we had in an earlier version of this presentation and we cut because it was real tight on time. But we're going to go through those now. We've gotten lots of questions about them as well. So, David, maybe you can bring up your screen here and we'll walk through those together, starting with the oceanic clearance process. So people wondering about, uh, firstly, if I need to request an oceanic clearance via voice, if that's at all possible. And then if it is, how would I go about doing that? So, uh, David, if you want to bring up your screen for us and you can walk us through that uh that'll be great um i don't actually or i, I can bring those up slides. as well for you let's do that i'll take All that right. yeah, yeah okay yeah you. okay yeah uh yeah no so uh you know uh you, you can have uh potential errors happening uh where you do need to request your channel clearance uh through voice um you know if you're lost suddenly you know you don't know what to do that's completely fine over at gander oceanic uh, .ca, we do have an oceanic clearance generator which it's not, it doesn't request a clearance for you, but it gives you like a text that you can just read out. You know, you can put all your details in, but then it generates a text that you can read out to the controller uh, that is going to have all of the information necessary there. Uh, so uh, an example we can uh, go ahead and do. We've got some examples. Oh, I'm, I'm, the, I'm the heavy version again? Okay, got it. Yeah, um, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Shamlock Radio, Shamlock Radio, version 127, request oceanic clearance. Uh, version 127, Shamlock Radio, pass the message. Uh, Shamrock Radio, Virgin 127, request clearance to Philadelphia. Track Echo, estimating mallet at, I can't read the time on the screen, uh, flight level 350, uh, Mach decimal 81. Virgin 127, Shamrock Radio, Roger, standby. So this time oh, you're going to have the controller. To, and I didn't, I forgot to include the uh, the highest able uh, flight level altitude, right. but you want to include that as well. Yeah. Uh, so in this time, the controller is now, you know, going to go back and look over through the, through all the numbers, uh, check if everything is okay. Uh, you know, if there's any, you know, anything that's strange, anything that they need, need to change. Uh, but once, uh, they are ready, once the controller is ready to issue the OCI and clearance, ATC will say Virgin 127, Shanwick Radio, Oceanic clearance. Uh, Virgin 127, go ahead. Uh, Oceanic clearance, Shanwick Radio clears Virgin 127 to Philadelphia. Uh, via Mallot, track echo. From Mallot, maintain flight level 350, Mach decimal 81. All right, we're cleared to Philadelphia via Mallet, track echo. From Mallet, maintain 350, Mach decimal 81, TMI 0, and or 2, Virgin 127. Virgin 127, read that correct. Return to domestic. Uh, in this Sorry, example, yeah, in this example, we can see it's, uh, 
<laughs> it's very important that you do read back the TMI. The TMI is the track message identifier. Uh, on the day this will be, uh, the TMI will be 092. I'm not actually sure we mentioned uh, what TMI is. Um, it's uh, basically the, the day of the year, the day of the year, the Julian right. calendar. Uh, the 1st of January is 001. Uh, December 31st is 365 or 366 if it's a leap year. But in the April 2nd, it's going to be TMI 092. So if you're ever requesting clearance by voice, in other words, right, 92nd day of the year, you're right. Uh, so if you're going to be requesting clearance by voice, it's very important that you do read back the TMI. Perfect. Um, we have a bit of a real world example of, on, on, on the next slide of a, a real life uh, check in. So this is a control on HF radio. Sorry, this is a pilot on HF radio. Uh, checking in with Shanwick radio. Uh, this was about a week uh, before this. Um, I have one request, yeah, C12, Shanwick yeah. radio. Today. This is your primary or secondary frequency is 8879 at 30 West Canada, 8831. Secondary 11279 or cell code checking in. So uh, as you can see, it's as simple as that. The control, uh, the pilot uh, then responded with circle check OK. And again, like we said, that's when you can turn down your HF radio. Uh, on VATSIM, it's a bit different because of some of the frequencies. Um, but um, uh, yeah, that, uh, generally that, generally speaking, that's more or less what you, what you can expect to hear uh, from the controllers. Perfect. Yeah, that's a good point about the frequencies, actually, isn't it? Um, because you know, it, VATSIM's... There is some sort of a cross simulation between HF and VHF, um, but for the most part, I think it's easiest just to say expect to be on regular VHF comm frequencies in the normal comm range uh, for across the pond because there's not enough aircraft that simulate the HF radios uh, properly. So just expect yeah, no. regular, yeah, regular comm frequencies wouldn't be receivable over that larger distance in, in reality. But it's just one of the kind of uh, what they call VATSIMism, something that we have to do to bend reality a little bit to make it work on the network. Yeah, that's that's obviously definitely why HF is used in real life, you know, because of the extended range. Um, like we said, uh, like Rob said, you know, on VATSIM, most aircraft can't actually simulate HF. So what the paired uh, to a VHF alias, uh, so it's like a VHF frequency, but you pretend it's an HF frequency. So yeah. Good deal. And position reports also came up on the FS Elite YouTube channel and from Darko06 on the VATSIM Twitch, wondering about how do we use position reports, if at all, are they going to be used during the event? Tell us about that. Um, so all Oceanic airspaces that you guys are going to be crossing through will be sim fully simulating it is via an ADSC. Uh, even, so obviously this is a real life mandate uh, for aircraft crossing the ocean between Flight Level 290 and Flight Level 410. Uh, but uh, on this cross upon day, because there's just so many pilots and unfortunately not too many controllers, uh, we won't be able to simulate position reports uh, um, for pilots, even if they want to simulate them. Uh, all aircraft will be assumed to be ADSB uh, capable uh, for the oceanic crossing. But what if there's an issue? Uh, I'm not, I'm, I'm, you know, we're saying what they're, we're most, they're, not, they're most likely not going to be used. Uh, well, if you ever need to use a position, uh, issue a position report, again, just like with the Oceanic Clearance, we do have a generator on the Gagander Oceanic website uh, that you can use in order to generate an Oceanic clear, uh, sorry, a position report. Uh, but the thing is, all the information for, that you need from your position report is found on your uh, MCD. There's a special MCD page or FMC page called Report, for example, on this screenshot. Um, and uh, uh, if uh, uh, my friend Rob... Uh, uh, we could just maybe simulate uh -huh. another, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, another um, interaction. Yeah, uh, Shamrock Radio version one two seven with position. Uh, Shan, uh, version one two seven, Shamrock Radio, passing message. Version one two seven is a mallet at one three one five Zulu, flight level three five zero. We're estimating five four north zero two zero west at one three four zero Zulu, then five six north zero three zero west next. Uh, Virgin 127, Shadow Copies, position Mallot at uh, 1315 Zulu, uh, flat up 350, uh, estimating 540020 west at 1340 Zulu, and uh, 560030 west next. Readback's correct, Virgin 127, thanks. So it's uh, as simple as that, it's just so that the pilots know, uh, so, so that the controller knows what position you crossed. Uh, obviously, the controller needs to read back that position report, and you need to make sure that that position report is correct. 
perfect. That might be the only time that we as pilots get to say read back correct. It's usually yeah, something exactly. the controllers no, get to say right. Out. So lots of questions, guys. I'm going to uh, try and go through them relatively quickly, and I've got them all categorized. If you ask a question, listen for your name, because I will try to call it out, and that way you know when to listen. Uh, so let's go. We're going to start with general questions and slot assignments first. From the VATS and Discord, Liam is asking, I've booked my slot, but I heard I also have to confirm it. How do I do that once I've got it booked? Oh, that's so, great. Yeah. Now, David, you want to take yeah. that one? I think so. I'm not 100% sure because I haven't actually flown in the last uh, year or so. But from what I can remember uh, back in the day, uh, what you need to do is, okay, you've got, you know, you've, got, you've, got, you've got your slot. The booking is confirmed. But in order to double check that you're still interested in flying, you will need to confirm the slot. So you'll get an email or something along those lines uh, where you will uh, be asked to click a button on the Cross the Pond website and uh, then you'll be able to confirm the slot. Correct me if I'm wrong uh, with that, no, uh, Rob? It, or it's, uh, yeah, CTP, that, that's in that net, and you have to go back to where you logged in. And yeah, so I was just, uh, while you were talking, I was looking up the days. Um, it's between Monday the 28th at 2000 Zulu and Thursday the 31st at 2000 Zulu. So between those two times, you must, must, must go back to that slot uh, the, that booking page and reconfirm that you do still intend to fly that slot because they have a, a large number of no shows. Uh, and so this is one of the means that they've implemented to try to combat uh, pilots that signed up for slots and then don't fly. So you do need to go back and reconfirm. Yes, I still intend to fly it. Yes, I got my wife's permission to be at the computer all day. Um, so, uh, or yeah, the 20, yeah, right. Well, yeah, fair enough. Well, uh, Monday the 28th at, at 2000 Zulu and Thursday the 31st at 2000 20, 20 Zulu, 2000 Zulu. Uh, so if you don't reconfirm, then those slots are all going to be reopened and given away at Thursday the 31st at 2000 Zulu. So again, that's uh, on the flip side of that, if you still don't have a slot, and I know that the, the ones that were uh, released from the lottery system probably are all gone by now. They are. But uh, but if you, uh, if you go back at Thursday the 31st at 2000 Zulu, anybody who forgot to reconfirm, their slots are going to be released. So that might be another opportunity for pilots who really want to be in the event to go grab one up. And I'm just going to make a quick technical note just to echo what was posted in the announcements. Apparently, there's a website issue, which is not a big surprise. Everyone's on there refreshing. That happens sometimes. The team is on it. Yeah. They're asking you not to refresh the website as that puts additional strain on the server. So give them a yeah. couple minutes and keep an eye on the Cross the Pond Discord for announcements yeah. on that. Now, if you don't have a slot, can you, first of all, get one from someone else? Can you exchange? Uh, where can you go to get one if you maybe are hoping to find a slot, but they're all gone? Well, first thing uh, yeah. I, w I would say was that what, what we just said. So that Thursday the 31st at 2000 is going to be that all those unconfirmed or unreconfirmed slots are going to be opened up. So that would be one. Yep. And also that same Discord slot exchange thread, there's a good place. I've myself have picked up many a slot because someone has just said, hey, I'm going to drop mine. And who's the first one to answer? And if you DM them right quick, sometimes you can get in there. So that's a good way to keep an eye on. Just keep your, your announcements or your slot exchange channel yep. notifications on. Ethan yep. from the VAT USA Discord, he has a slot for Paris to Tampa, wants to know if he's getting a specific route. So how do the routes work for Cross the Pond? Is ATC assigning stuff? Do I have to find them myself? So uh, this is just something a bit that we talked a bit about before, but... Uh... About maybe six to 12 hours before Cross the Pond itself, uh, you will get an email saying, here's your routing, here's your flight level. You go on the ctp.batson.net website in the pilot dashboard, you will have mm, a, a, lot of the, a lot of useful information. Like we said before, the VZ is part of the route. You will have the full route there that you will use for your whole flight. You also have what track you're flying, uh, what flight level you need to use uh, uh, when you're requesting oceanic clearance, uh, etc. Uh, so the routing is given to you. You don't need to worry about it. Just use the route that's given to you on the CTP pilot web, uh, pilot dashboard. Perfect. The Batum Discord, Liesl wants to know, what do you do if your call sign is taken? You booked a slot, you had a call sign, now someone else is using that call sign. Uh, very good question, actually. Um, it's uh, one of those unfortunate things where uh, Batum organizers and supervisors cannot actually guarantee that you keep your call sign uh, in case someone else takes it before you connect. Uh, that doesn't matter, though, in terms of your slot, because your slot is tied to your CID. It's tied to your Avatsim uh, uh, ID. Uh, so don't worry, your slot is still there. You know, you, you'll still get to depart on time, uh, but you'll probably have to pick a different call sign, unfortunately. Yeah, and what I've done, that, that actually happened to me one year, and um, 
I, I always try to find the call sign that corresponds with a real world flight that's flying that city pair. And of course, it's not always the case and not always possible. Um, but the one year that I did that, obviously somebody that had a slot earlier than mine, or I think wasn't actually wasn't even flying with a slot, I uh, was just jumped on and onto the network flying as that same call sign. So it's just very simply just modify the call sign a little bit so that you it, so that it's close enough um, for your own purpose. I mean, you could choose a completely different call sign if you want, um, but I just modified it in a little in a little way. Just I think I I was supposed to be sh um, Shamrock One Thirty Six, and I wound up just flying as Shamrock Three Six Whiskey. Um, you can put the original call sign that you booked under in your remarks if you want, but it's not even really that necessary because, as David said, the software that uh, all the controllers are using to correlate your uh, your login with your book slot is not going by the call sign, but it's going by who you are. It's going by your uh, your CID, your VAT SIM ID number. Two questions about aircraft types, and then we're going to go into Europe, Oceanic, and North America, just the same way we did the presentation. Gabriel from the VAT SIM Discord wants to know what type of aircraft do controllers prefer? What should we avoid? So I touched on that a little bit at the beginning, but can you remind us what are good airplanes to fly? What should we not fly? Um, so I guess on my side, uh, I, uh, first of all, a jet. Like, uh, don't don't fly prop across the ocean. Uh, even if you're going to be using unlimited fuel, uh, just you know stick to a jet because you know if you do have a slot, you, uh, the controllers are going to want you to fly at a reasonable Mach number at a reasonable speed like everyone else. We recommend something that can physically make it that would make it in real life, maybe an A321 Neo XLR. Um, or however it's called, uh, you know, maybe like a heavy A330, A340, A350, uh, 777, 747. Uh, Concorde is something we do not want you to fly, uh, because Concorde's fly very high, and, uh, you know, like Evan said, if you depart, uh, like everyone else on time, then you're going to get there before ATC even gets on at, uh, in, in North America. Um, so yeah, don't, please don't fly Concorde, we know that, uh, well, yeah. <laughs> or the DC-6. Like I don't want to get end. into... <laughs> Any controversy with this next one, so we'll say this as correctly as we can, but a lot of people asked about the newly released Rotate MD-11 for X-Plane. Is that a good airplane to fly? What do you guys think? And I'll answer if you're well, too scared to. Here's here's my answer, and I'm going to tie it in. I'm not even going to sp talk specifically about that aircraft, but here's my answer, and I think it'll answer the question. Fly an aircraft that you are comfortable that you will properly be able to respond to the instructions and comply with the clearances that you're given. If you think you can fly that aircraft and comply with all the instructions, including the you know vertical altitude restrictions on the of climb and the descent, then okay, then go ahead and fly that plane. If you don't think you're going to be able to do that, then you shouldn't. You should pick something that you're more comfortable in, more familiar with, and and have higher expectations that it will do what you intend it to do. I was going to say the same thing, so that's perfect. Uh, that USA Cross Upon Discord, Joshua and Brian, both were asking about older aircraft with INS. Maybe they're RVSM capable for en route, but they can't necessarily do an RNAV sitter star. Is that a good aircraft to fly? Um, yeah, Rob, if you want to. Well, I was going to say, my take on that is, as so somebody who loves flying non-RNAV aircraft, as the title of my stream might suggest, uh, here's what I would say for Cross the Pond. <laughs> Uh, and it ties into the, the last thing I said in one of my last slides is this cross the pond is not a day where you want to be making a bunch of special requests to the controllers. They're already going to be at their limits with workload. Uh, now, that being said, I've I've heard some of the you know domestic controllers say, oh, you know, we've got the capacity. We can give you a vector. We can give you something that's going to just put you basically on the same path. I would I would say. My recommendation is don't my recommendation is cross the pond is do what everyone else is doing day that's 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 my feeling on it yeah and I, maybe my only addition would be you know if your route allows it like if you can physically fly that route that you were given and maybe some runway changes in there you're probably fine but for sure if your route is needing certain capabilities that your aircraft doesn't have it might be a good idea to try and swap that around and just rob you just sent me this a minute ago uh, i'm not sure if i can say the name right kev mikwa maybe from your twitch channel was asking <laughs> they're planning to fly as non-event traffic they're not flying across the ocean but can they fly to the departure and the arrival airports? Can they fly within the participating FIRs, ARTCCs, if they're not an event slotted traffic? And um, 
I'll I'll answer and then you can kind of chime in on and on and piggyback. I would say so. The the question as it was phrased to me was, I know I need to avoid the departure and arrival airports, and I would say right. not necessarily. Uh, the big bottleneck across the pond t- typically is the nat tracks. A lot of the uh, the origin and departure. I'm sorry, the origin and, and arrival fields. You know, often say, oh, they they could could have capacity for more aircraft. Um, I think that you can do, do a flight among the arrival airfields. You just you need to expect that you might be put into a hold or you might be you know, given vectors for sequencing or you might not get the optimal altitude and the route that you want because of the event traffic that's going on. Yep. But I wouldn't say that you shouldn't necessarily. I, I would not agree with the, the assertion that you have to avoid the uh, event airfields. I would say the big thing to avoid is the oceanic airspace. Yeah, I agree. I mean, lots of people fly into boston from domestic they might get a bit of a delay many more people depart our airport right so i'm going to be controlling boston we'll see a lot of departures departures are easy they don't slow down our arrivals in any way come fly depart it'll be fully staffed and then Mm -hmm. go somewhere like maybe kennedy which isn't an event airport or go somewhere in cleveland center in our example somewhere in the midwest of the u.s if there's a atc on there they will be wanting traffic because they'll be jealously watching the flow of traffic coming in over the ocean (laughs) so that's a great place to go yeah i think definitely fly in the event airports if you want to but do something maybe that's different than what everybody else is doing that way you avoid the delay and you're helping to balance out the traffic on the network so let's move into europe lots of questions about european operations starting off with david's twitch uh you may not know the answer because i certainly don't but they were asking why do pilots need to report q and h in europe we don't need that in north america America. They're saying you already reported the ATIS. It has the QNH in it. The QNH changes, and they're going to get it when they push anyway. So how come when they call for clearance, they have to say a QNH? Do you have any ideas? I'll be completely honest. I can't give a solid answer, but what I can expect is, uh, you know, controllers want to reduce uh, RTF radio, uh, radio telepathy uh, time. You know, the time they spend on the frequency. So if the pilot reports the Q&H and uh, then the controller knows that okay they have the Q&H on board, then the pilot doesn't have to say the Q&H again uh to the pilot uh that's my only guess like like i said i can't give a certain answer but i'd say that's about as close as i can get in terms of a guess good stuff thank you from flight sim association first officer tim can you tell us more about the tsat tsat times and potential for delays at the gate uh right yeah so uh essentially uh, in europe the way you know if we if there's suddenly too many planes that want to depart too many planes at the gate uh, you know, the runway still has a maximum number of people it can take. You can't take everyone all at once. Uh, so once at an airport, you know, once they realize, okay, we have too many people that want to push the taxi, you know, the, no one can push at the same time because then in the end, you're just going to end up with a lot of aircraft blocking each other on the taxiways and it's going to be chaos. So uh, what they do is uh, they have a cert- certain plugins, for example, the CDM plugin, uh, which uh, are used to organize aircraft into slot times. Uh, so these plugins take a lot of factors into account. Uh, and the, the plugin, you know, okay, you report when you're ready for push and start. The plugin issues you a TSAT, a target startup approval time, which is when you can, ex, you know, you stay at your gate, but that's when you can expect to start pushing. So you stay at your gate, you monitor the delivery or, or frequency or whatever frequency you're at, uh, and you can expect to push at your TSAT. Uh, that's just so that the runway doesn't get filled up or the taxiways don't get filled up uh, so that we can have a more organized way of letting everyone out, you know? Uh, say you have a lot of children at the canteen that want to go eat, uh, grab food. The canteen, you know, there's a lot of children, but that the canteen isn't quite big. So you organize back, uh, all the kids by groups and then you kind of let some go one at a time. That's generally speaking, that's more or less how it works. <laughs> yeah, it ties back into what something that you said in one of your slides, David, which is that um, the delivery controller is often going to not want you to switch to ground until they've told you to. And that's basically because what happens is they know what your slot time is. And we, and again, CTOT is in terms of your wheels up time. So it's really on the local staff at the airport to make sure that uh, as long as you've connected at the proper time and you've you've requested pushback at the proper time it's then on them to make sure that you meet your slot time so they're going to be the ones coordinating timing so they're going to be managing how long before you know how long of a taxi does he have what's the current delay at the, the departure runway so they'll kind of then manage what's the optimal time to have you push back from the gate 
you've had some Twitch question, you're using CP DLC, do you still need to check in via voice on every new frequency? Yes, you definitely do. Uh, CP DLC uh, is something that is used to relieve the workload of, of the controller. But VHF uh, audio uh, communication still remains the primary method of communications, which means, you know, even, you know, same flying with CP DLC, and I get the instructions through the CP DLC, contact, I don't know, London Control 129.425. I say, okay, Wilco, I switch to that frequency, I still make the initial call on voice. You know, maybe I'll, I will already be connected to the CPDLC by then. But always, I still always have to make the initial call by voice, and then any further instructions can either be given through CPDLC or maybe by voice. It's also very important that you keep listening to the frequency, to, don't tune down and be ready to accept an instruction or accept a readback when you're given an instruction through voice. Perfect. And the last comment from the VATS and Twitch as well. Might be hard to find a parking spot at a lot of these airports. Don't worry about picking the perfect spot for the airline that you're flying. Just find somewhere where there's no other planes and get yourself moving because that's quite a common thing we'll see. It's going to be busy. Moving on to Oceanic, FSA First Officer Tim. Will the assigned tracks take into account the jet stream and will they be assigning both odd and even flight levels over the ocean? I'll get to the simpler odd even question. Yes, uh, both odd and even levels will be used uh, in order to uh, fit more people into the airspace. Still 1,000 feet separation over the ocean. Uh, in terms of the uh, tracks, uh, yes and no. Because of the logistics <laughs> of the large cross the pond event, we have to make the tracks in advance. But uh, what we do with, uh, with the cross the pond planning team is we go on windy.com and we uh, use a few other uh, resources in order to predict what the wind is going to be like on the day. And then we try our best to build the tracks as much as possible based on what we think the wind is going to be. We can't right. guarantee that it's going to be perfect, but we do our best. And that's the way the real world net tracks are. And that's why they vary from day to day is exactly because of um, tailoring them for the most efficient crossing based on the weather phenomena of that day. So it's, it's, it's almost like the that sim shamwick and gander team is really mimicking what the real world shamwick and gander team is in terms of looking at the forecast and creating uh the routes that are going to avoid the worst of the headwinds or, and so forth we talked about how to get oceanic clearance on that track a question on the vat sim twitch can that also be done via cp dlc via hoppy or is that track the only place to get oceanic clearance that's a very good question and uh actually it you know it kind of goes back to why we have that track the reason we have Natrek is ultimately because Natrek is supposed to be a replacement to what they use uh, in real life. In real life, CPDLC is mandated where I'm wanting to enter most of the uh, North Atlantic airspace. Uh, and in real life, most aircraft will be requesting Oceanic clearance to CPDLC. Unfortunately, on VATSIM, uh, in terms of Oceanic sectors, most uh, don't have uh, CPDLC as developed yet. Um, I think maybe a few Oceanic sectors have CPDLC uh, available if they want to request the Oceanic clearance through that. I know that Shanwick and Gander definitely do not have such technology ready just yet. We will be working on something in the future, uh, but for now, uh, CPDLC will most likely not be available for most um, Oceanic airspaces. Uh, maybe, maybe Santa Maria, but do not quote me on that. Um, so still, you know, th that's the whole reason why we're using that track in order to relieve workload and in order for you guys to be able to request the Oceanic clearance from that track. And you'll actually see, uh, I'm probably going to be looking in the slides for quite a while, but you actually uh, see that once you get your Oceanic clearance, it looks very similar to what you would get in real life through CPDLC. Uh, it, we try to replicate that as much as possible. So, yeah. Perfect. Continuing on the Oceanic clearance theme, Ben Lyson from the Vatsim Twitch, and speaking of Santa Maria, if I depart from Tenerife, do I get Oceanic clearance on the ground or in the air? Very good question. If you depart Tenerife, uh, as we mentioned before, you have to take off first, but as soon as you take off, as soon as you have all of the information you need, request your Oceanic clearance as soon as possible. Still, you know, depart, but uh, as soon as you depart, you need to try to get the Oceanic clearance as soon as possible so that we can get your Oceanic clearance handled as soon as possible and so that we can maybe restructure you or uh, you know, refit you in a correct puzzle structure. Um, yeah. For everybody else, you said 30 to 60 minutes prior, no less than 30 minutes to get your oceanic clearance. How would they figure out what 30 minutes from the oceanic boundary is? Uh, well, you will need to know what your oceanic entry point is. Typically, you know, for most aircraft that are going to be flying from Shannon to Shannon, for example, this is going to be a waypoint at the 15 west degree uh, boundary. 
uh, 151 degree longitudinal um, boundary. Uh, this could be at 10 degrees maybe as well. It just depends. Uh, you could use a website like Sky Vector, for example, to see what your oceanic entry point is or Navigraph maybe. Um, but as soon as you figure out what your oceanic entry point is, the point is the border. The point is when you enter the ocean and you just need to get your ETA for that, for that uh, oceanic entry point from the MCDU, like we showed before, you can get the ETA from the FMC or MCDU, and then that's how you figure out how far away you are from the ocean. When yeah, I was going to say, I'm sorry. Oh, go ahead. Thanks. You know, cut in, but um, but I was going to say, yeah, if you look at it on Sky Vector, you'll see there's a blue jagged boundary that marks the border between the domestic sector and uh, and um, Shanwick's. And so you can kind of use that as like, and you can all really, all you need to do is plot your origin to that point. Remember that that doesn't have to be this precise. You know, it's anywhere between 30 and 90 minutes prior to getting to that point. So if you can estimate about an hour, you know, and you know that your jet flies at 450 knots. So, okay, well, about 450 miles prior to that border is when I should start thinking about call. Perfect. So we've got the oceanic clearance sorted out. Now moving into questions about cell cal, Martin and Ross. First of all, if I do get a cell cal check, which is typically done when you're checking out with a new frequency, do I need to answer that? And what's the phraseology? So you get a cell cal ping. Um, I guess I should have maybe tried to include some phraseology um, in the real world example that we did. Uh, the HF quality wasn't the perfect. But no, once you get that cell cal ping, you need to respond with, quote, cell cal check, OK. Oh, end end quote. Uh, which basically means that, you know, it tells the controllers, okay, the circle check was good, and that's what initiates your circle watch. So circle check, okay. Perfect. And if you forget to do that cell cal check, will you be prompted to? Um, it depends. You might be, you might not be. Uh, quite honestly, it just depends on the controller uh, that is with you. The controller might ask, you know, would you like to get a circle check so if, if you want to meet in a a uh, circle watch, uh, they might not ask you, but if you do not maintain the circle watch, then you are expected to be maintaining listening watch, uh, which means you will be expected to always uh, listen to the frequency and uh, you're expected to be able to respond if ATC, asks, if ATC calls you. And from Ross, developer of so many Batsm applications, vPilot, VRC, ERAM, everything basically, the whole network is just response. It's him at this point. So Ross wants to know, I better get this Hi, right. Ross. Uh, so he's asking about cell care phraseology when you get a cell cal ping. How are you supposed to respond to that? Uh, like I said, cell cal check, okay. So you get the ping. Oh, no. Ping when, is... like, so later on when you're flying. Yeah, when you're flying you're... and they ah, cell cal okay. you. Yep. Right, okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so at this at this point, you just imagine as if ATC went, uh, imagine, one, uh, imagine 127, channel gradient, right? They're trying to get to you. So you you tune up the frequency when you're ready to speak. When you hear a gap in the, in the, in the transmission, you say, um, Channel creator, your channel creator, version one two seven, and that's it. No, say a call sign to indicate that you're there on frequency. Uh, you're ready to receive that message. Perfect. And off the that, some Twitch. Last oceanic question from Virtual Pilot: Will root offsets be needed for cross the pond? And can you talk about SLOP, strategic lateral offset procedure? I think. Yeah, mm -hmm. that yeah, that, that's correct. That's actually a very good question. Not something we covered on the webinar. Um, this is something that's described in more detail in our knowledge base, but. The strategic lateral officer procedure is a procedure uh, that is done in real life uh, on a daily basis by pilots where they can deviate for a maximum of two nautical miles to the right. It's always to the right, uh, and they have to do so as you know when they feel that's appropriate to do so. Uh, they, can, they can deviate to the right by a maximum of two nautical miles without ATC authorization. And if everyone does it, you know, let's say there's a technical issue and you've got two aircraft flying towards each other in a, in a head-on collision, right? If both aircraft exercise uh, as slow procedures and they both deviate to the right by two nautical miles, you know, I'll, I guess I'll try to demonstrate this, you know, they deviate <laughs> and suddenly you have four nautical miles of separation just because they exercise that slow. So it's kind of like a, a fail switch in case things do go, go wrong. It's a safe measure in, uh, to prevent collisions from happening. And let me ask this, David, because of my understanding years ago when uh, I was writing some training material for uh, for Oceanic Crossing was that pilots have three choices, basically. They fly the route as it's entered. They fly, they fly one mile to the right or they fly two miles to the right. It's not like anywhere in between. It's kind of meant to be either zero, one or two miles offset to the right of your of your. Uh, cleared path is, is that is that still correct 
Correct. Yeah. So like, okay. so yeah, you're, you're completely right in that. Uh, like I said, there's no ATC authorization needed for that. Uh, if you look on the track message on the FEA issued track message by Gander and Shanwick facilities in real life, they say something along the lines of, you know, pub operators have to remember to exercise SLOP or uh, commit to SLOP procedures, not just for weather deviation. So, you know, you have to constantly be doing right. it. Yeah. Yeah, that's 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 an important point. Is this that's not the same thing as a weather deviation. This is this is a means of making it more random so that uh, two aircraft that accidentally get a clearance to the same place at the same time have yeah, a one in three chance or or whatever it is to to not be at the same place at the same time. Yeah, certainly yeah. not a requirement. So if you're not if you have no idea what we're talking about, don't worry about it. And if you don't know how to yeah, do root exactly. offset in your FMS, no problem. Yeah. It's something that you see, and we got the question, so we yeah. thought we'd answer it. And I think the other thing that's that's important about uh, uh, about slop is that it has to be something that your FMC does automatically. It, you can't just start programming in points that are one or two miles, you know, off of your course. If if the, the, the if the FMC is specifically designed to do a one mile offset or a two mile offset, then you may do that. If not, just fly the path you're programmed. Yep, perfect. So, Rob, going into North America now, we're up to North American questions. Sure. And guys, if you have other questions, uh, we're happy to stick around for a little while. So it's in the Cross the Pond Discord that you need to go into. So if you're not there already, start with the Cross the Pond website. There's a link to the Cross the Pond Discord. In the Cross the Pond Discord, <laughs> there is a webinar Q&A channel. And that's where you need to be. Any questions that you post there, I will pass along. So as we move into North America, first question is, Rob, you talked about getting the ATIS miles back via text, even before mm -hmm. you get into voice range, 200 miles back, 250 miles back, right? You're doing your transitions. You're plugging in all the waypoints. You're doing your briefing, talking through all the stuff. What happens? It, well, first of all, maybe you can tell us, uh, can I ask the center controller what runway I can expect? Are they going to know? <laughs> no. So that's uh, that's an excellent point. Um, on that sim, I think we get used to the idea because of the way top-down coverage works that the center controller is controlling everything. Um, in the situations where a center controller has an approach facility working underneath them, it's it's the responsibilities are split up much the same way as they are in the real world, which is the center controller handles en route traffic and handles the process of getting an aircraft from on their en route segment of their route to the terminal approach. Um, but it's really the approach controllers that decide what runway is issued to each plane. And so the center controller, when they give you that descend via, Oftentimes, like we said before, they're going to give you a, a two, runway 27 transition because the approach controllers have said, this is what you need to be issuing for descents into Boston today, please. So they'll say, you know, Ocean 5 arrival runway 27 transition. Or if it's something like um, Dulles, they'll say, you know, descend via the hyper whatever. I think it's hyper 5, hyper 5 arrival, Dulles landing north or Dulles landing south. So you'll know whether you need to take the fork that sets you up for a northbound arrival to the ones or to a southbound arrival to the 19s. But that's all the center knows is which transition of the star did approach tell me I need to be issuing that day. The actual ass assignments are given by the approach controller. And so maybe the case, just like in real life, where you get to 15,000 feet, you check on with approach and they say, expect this runway. And you're like, uh-oh, got to change it. So that's just yep. what happens. And that's just life. And yep. Sim737 Pilot on our YouTube channel makes a great point to us controllers. We should also be mindful of the time it takes you pilots to change runways and to deal with the fact that we've done that to you. And so we do try to take yeah. that into account because we know if there's multiple runways, you may not guess right. Um, yep. Martin from the Cross the Pond Discord goes, uh, if I'm not supposed to report established on the localizer in Canada or the U.S., what do I say? You don't have to say anything there. <laughs> Once you're cleared for the approach, uh, you read back that approach clearance. But once you're on the localizer, you don't have to say a darn thing. Matter of fact, the, the more you say there, the more you're tying up the frequency for the other instructions that the controller needs to give to other aircraft. You do not need to say established on the localizer. The next thing that you're likely going to hear is the controller issuing you the handoff to the tower controller. Good questions about descents and climb rates. So Martin asked this question and also Brian recently. Um, if Well, first of all, maybe is there a standard for how many vertical feet per minute you should climb or descend at uh, that you guys can talk to? Um, I'll say that a good rule of thumb is that the stars are typically designed on an average descent of a three degree glide slope. So a good rule of thumb for um, a three, three degree descent is that for every 
a uh, thousand feet of altitude you need to lose, you need approximately three miles of lateral progress to drop that thousand feet. So that's a pretty easy, you know, um, for every, you know, if I'm, if I need to descend from 30,000 to 10,000, okay, that's 20,000. So that's, that's 20. And then I need three miles per the 20. So I'm going to need 60 miles more or less to make that descent. And then the, the descent rate that you need to achieve is um, approximately five times your ground speed. So my indicated airspeed might be 220 because I'm way up in, you know, in the high flight levels. But what am I doing across the ground? You know, your GPS, uh, your nav screen will usually tell you, um, you know, I'm making about 460 knots across the ground. Well, you know, okay, multiply that by five and five times four is 2000 and then 60 times five is another. So, yeah, about 2300 or so vertical descent rate. That's a good kind of ballpark. Your aircraft that does VNAV will probably do that for you if it's working properly and if you've set it up properly. Um, but yeah, a vertical descent rate about five times your ground speed is a good ballpark. It gets you close enough, and then you can kind of see you can monitor your progress as you get closer, and uh, and kind of adjust from there. Perfect. So Brian, I think that answers your question pretty well about descent calculations. And then I just layer on top of that that of course if you're given a restriction whatever it takes to make that restriction, right? So if you're told to cross a certain point at a certain altitude, that's your objective. Whatever you have to do in your airplane to make that right. happen, right? Then obviously yeah. that's what we're going to be doing. And that may have, that may yeah. impact how far you're, how soon you're descending. Um, anything else, Rob? Yeah, go ahead. One, uh, yeah, one little side point is that certain stars, you know, again, and, and, I, and I preface by saying an average descent of a three degrees, there are certain stars that will take you on a much shallower descent at the initial part, and then they'll have a much steeper descent on the later part. And the reason for that is typically because they're routing you around other airspace or over other airspace. And the, the purpose of a star and a SID is to give you one clearance that then gets you out of the way of all the other arriving and departing traffic at your airport and all the other airports that you're passing by. So um, so there can be instances where you're getting a steeper descent or a shallower descent because of the way the airspace is built. But the three degrees is a good kind of general baseline. I'm going to ask this question because it's kind of funny. Uh, that's some Twitch Neptool 555 asks, if you're told to descend when ready or at pilot's discretion, do you have to report top of descent? You're supposed to. Yeah. I love that busy question. frequency you can't always get it in but you're supposed to yeah in theory the compliance on that is what maybe 10 percent in real life i'm gonna guess but it's in there it's in the aim as we're supposed to do it but whether or not yeah. people actually do it yeah, i don't know and i i agree with you if it's busy i'm certainly not going to be rushing to get it in there it's not the most important transmission you'll make so if that's if, if it's uh so if it's something that you a forget or b just can't seem to get the word in edgewise to do it it's not the worst thing yeah samuel beard from the vats and cross the pond discord and by the way we're out of the pre categorized questions. So I hope you like the way I categorize those, but we're now into yeah. uncharted territory. This is Definitely. just whatever I'm yeah. reading. So uh, you'll have to bear with us. Samuel Beard wants to know, and I think the answer is maybe you've already answered this, but can we reposition into a departure airport and then turn around and fly our slotted transatlantic flight? So if I'm, underst yeah, I'm, if I'm understanding. So the instead question... of, you know, basically the question is instead of starting at Gatwick, can I fly into Gatwick earlier and then just do my flight from there? Uh, yeah, I actually, I think that's that's perfectly legit yeah. because uh, really, like I said, it's a it's a domestic operation. So you're not uh, the, the really the only thing they're asking you not to do is fly transoceanic without a book slot. So if what you're asking, can, may I or can I, then the answer is pretty much yes, it, well, as long as it's not that. <laughs> yep. Perfect. Luke wants to know. Yeah, if, I mean, oh, sorry. Go ahead, David. Yeah, I mean, you know, I was just going to say. Yeah, obviously you can do that, but you have to bear in mind, you know, if you have, if there's if if you have an airport that has one single runway, for example, like Gatwick, you know, bear in mind it might take a while for you to actually get down there. So don't miss your slot. Uh, right. The part yeah. in time. A lot of extra time, yeah. indeed. And Luke wants to know if his simulator crashes or they're disconnect from the network, whatever, and you have an auto save, you can get it back. Is it okay to load back up mid-flight? Oh boy. I would, uh... Uh, well, uh, <laughs> it, it, it depends. Um, what the preferential method is, uh, once you connect back in, uh, you connect as an observer. So when, you, when you're when you connecting again, there's a tick box that you, that you can check. Connect into shared cockpit mode, connect as an observer. What we prefer you do is connect, is take that box, connect, message that controller you're with, tell them your location, your flight level, and say, hey, you know, my SIM crashed. Am I good to reconnect back on the network? That's the preferential way of doing it just in case, you know, maybe you'll reconnect into someone else or, you know, very, very close to someone else. Uh, but yeah, no, generally speaking, you should more 
more or less be fine. Uh, you should be okay with uh, uh, reconnecting back on the network. That shouldn't yeah, be just that big an issue. Yeah, just expect that the controller will need to probably vector you or, or hold you or whatever in order to fit you back into the flow because the gap that you were flying in previously is now far ahead and that they've got to work you back into the sequence further back in line. So you may have to, you know, be willing to be accommodated in that regard, but... But yes. I know I know we've gotten this question before, but I keep getting the question, and so I want to just really make sure everyone is 100% clear on this. Someone wants to know, can they fly transatlantic but between non-event airports? Nope. No. <laughs> it's not you, recommended. If you don't have a nope. slot, please do not fly transatlantic. Anywhere else on the network is fine. Fly to the airports that are in the event. Fly between the airports in the event. But if you don't have a slot, please do not fly over the Atlantic between the, the two continents. That's what we're trying to get across. Uh, question about RTA. So I guess with the oceanic clearance, you may have, you know, cross the oceanic fix at a certain time. If your aircraft doesn't have an RTA page, someone's wanting to know if they can adjust their speed in order to achieve that time. Um, yeah, sure. Uh, I would say that's definitely something they can do. I think a big part of that is just, you know, if you do get such a restriction and uh, you don't think you'll be able to meet it in your current conditions, talk to the current controller you're talking with. If, you know, obviously, yeah, try to adjust your speed and uh, let them know that, okay, you know, we're facing this issue. We're not sure if, you know, we're maybe going to uh, reach this uh, restriction. If it's a restriction like cross at this point at like 1455 or later, again, talk to the controller, reduce the speed because the controller also, most controllers also have tools that can see uh, your ETA for a waypoint. Um, you know, so talk to the controller. Maybe the controller can give you a dog leg uh, before you enter the ocean. So I think, yeah, obviously you can adjust the speed, but a, a big part of that is talking to the, to the controller, uh, the controller, because controllers are Yep, yeah, and I think the, the guideline, if I remember it correctly, was that if your ETA to a point in oceanic airspace is changing by more than three minutes of than what you reported, and then you need to get back with the controller, let them know the updated ETA, and then they can either issue you a speed adjustment or what have you. Yeah, uh, the best way to, to do that is literally just, just to tell the controller you're talking to again, you know, how we have a re revised estimate for the entry point, if you could let Shanwick know or whatever, and uh, then they'll act accordingly. Good point from Ian in the Q&A channel, just reminding us all that if you can, and if it's possible, have the latest AIRAC, whether you're using Navigraph or Aerosoft or another service to do that. I know it's not possible for everybody, but if you can, having updated navigation data, especially for this event, would be critical. So maybe you guys want to just talk to that briefly. Uh, yeah, no, I definitely fully agree. Um because airports do change every month. Every month there's new changes. For example, just uh, two days ago, we, uh, you know, in Barcelona, uh, the runway changed because of uh, magnetic uh, um, deviation. Oh, nice. Um, yeah. So now it's, instead of zero seven, it's zero six left and right, and uh, two four left and right. Uh, in a lot of areas, you're gonna have complete, you know, you can have completely new uh, and a complete new revision of SIDs and stars. A completely new, a complete new revision of the way arrivals and departures work. Um, so yeah, it's obviously very important that you, you don't, you know, if you can't, if you're, if you're not able to update your net error cycle every month, you know, okay, that's fine, but, uh, make sure you, uh, try to keep as updated as you can. And if you don't know what we're talking about, there's a great guide on the Flight Sim Association website about nav data, where you can find it. There are free options as well for some simulators, so have a look at that if you have no idea what we're asking about. Uh, yeah. Pete, I think that's how I pronounced the name, and I apologize if I've done that incorrectly, asking when will the airport briefings be issued? The easy answer is the answer. sometime between now and next week. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I just saw I just saw they were asking a few facilities for their final version. So I think very soon you'll see them. Um, I know yeah. some years they don't publish them publicly, which I think is a shame. I think there was a couple of years where it was like only people with slots had them. Uh, maybe the intention was just to avoid people actually flying without a slot. But I'm hoping they'll be public. But definitely if you have a slot in the CTP dashboard where your route will show up, that's where you'll find that. And it should be pretty yeah. soon. Yeah, and I would say just keep checking the uh, ctp.vatsim.net website every day or so to see if uh, if yours have been posted. 
Perfect. And as we come up on two hours, I think we're going to have one last question. This is from Dale, Flight Sim Association first officer watching from Central Michigan. Hi, Dale. Thanks for being on. He's not going to fly in the event, but he wants to know if I want to watch or listen or observe. Where are some places that you guys can think of that might be good places? And I could share a couple of ideas as well. <laughs> yeah, Extremes. well, there's, yeah, I was going to say, there's going to be a ton of Twitch streamers, uh, both pilots and controllers. Uh, and unfortunately, as I mentioned, uh, this will be one of the ones that I miss uh, for the first time in a, in a long time, but uh, but not my stream, unfortunately. But many, many, if you search VATSIM on the day of on Twitch, you'll you'll get dozens and dozens of hits. YouTube, probably same thing. Yep. David, yeah. any thoughts from you? Yeah, I mean, uh, like I said, uh, Twitch streams is the main thing. Uh, personally speaking, I think most likely I'll, I'll be streaming uh, that, so people on my channel get ready for that. Uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, so like I said, I'll probably be streaming uh, the Tenerife uh, uh, control uh, or any positions there. Uh, you can also connect as an observer. You know, if you have the resources to, to get yeah. a to get a controller client and connect, and then you know, then you can listen to any frequency you want to listen to. You can take a look at some of the traffic. Uh, over the, you know, maybe if, if you want to look at the traffic over the ocean, at the sequence that the brilliant Boston Approach Controller is building, uh, et cetera. Uh, um, and yeah, and I'll, I'll, to add on some, to something you just said, David, it doesn't necessarily have to be a controller client. You can connect as an observer as a pilot client. It, it does, I think the options in both X Pilot and V Pilot are marked um, observer mode for shared cockpit, but observer mode is not necessarily for shared cockpit. It can be anytime you want to connect to the network and just uh, see what's going on without appearing on uh, controller scopes or to other aircraft. So it's a good way to kind of just be invisible, but listen in on what all's going on. Yep. Yeah, perfect. I think a lot of people are also going to be posting a lot of screenshots if you want to check those out. Oh, yeah. Yep. Yeah, yep. they're going to be all over the place. Yeah, pretty pretty much everywhere. If you just search for Vatsim Cross the Pond, I think probably on the Vatsim Twitter, or there is even a Vatsim Cross the Pond Twitter that you can go to and you can watch on there. They'll I'm sure be sharing those screenshots. Last year for Cross the Pond, Volanta also had this thing where they were actually showing like how many pilots were connected from each of the different simulators, and they had like a really cool visual. Uh, obviously, there's a bunch of the network monitoring nice. tools, Vatspy, Simaware. Yeah. I don't even name them all because I won't even be able to get close. Mm -hmm. But lots of ways and for sure we encourage that you know we've talked a lot about uh, a lot of things in the last two hours here one of the things i don't want to do is leave anyone with the notion of sort of being discouraged right like it's easy to go oh my gosh how would i remember all this stuff and you know this is a learning network, right? And the cross the pond is no different. You have to do your homework, but if you've done that, nobody's going to yell at you, get in, get you in trouble, right? If you've read the pilot briefings, if you've been on this webinar, you've already taken a huge step in making sure that you're ready to that's, go. And that's yeah. really what you need to do. And the rest will be easy, just like any other network flight. And if you're around on the day and you're not flying across the ocean, maybe because you don't have a slot or you want to observe, you know, come on and fly. You'll be able to hear it. You'll be able to participate. You may not have flown the transatlantic part, but you're going to get everything else just the same as it would be. So I think that's I think that basically covers it. Uh, Rob, David, any last comments, thoughts, ideas, suggestions from you as we uh, get set to wrap up here? No, no, and I think um, this has been a, just a really super comprehensive program, Evan. And a thanks, thank you again for putting that on and for inviting me to be a part of it. Yeah, I'm uh, echoing Rob's words, Evan. Thank you so much for helping organize us, you and the FSA team and uh, everyone else that helped uh, put this uh, thing together. Uh, if you do have any more questions, you know, the Cross the Pond Discord is the place to go. You can ask loads of questions either to the community or the organizers and uh, they'll be able to answer. Uh, I think like we said before, you know, you can uh, find Rob on his Twitch and Discord. You can mm -hmm. find me on a bunch of Discords as well uh, if you have any questions. And uh, yeah. Wonderful. Thanks again to you, to everyone who's watching. Friendly reminder, the slides are available on our website, link at the bottom of the screen, and the survey. Please take a moment at flightsimassociation.com slash survey and let us know how we did. Let us know if you'd like to see this type of presentation again for some of the big VATSIM events. It's been a pleasure being here. Thank you again to both of our presenters, to everyone for watching, to our moderators for helping support. And for those of you, if you're looking to help support us at Flight Simulation Association, you can do that by becoming a member at Flight flightsimassociation.com. Totally free to join. You can also upgrade to Captain for $3 a month. You get a pile of discounts, extra perks on the website, and you're helping to support us while we do stuff like this. Thanks again, everyone, for watching. Have a wonderful night. We will see you on April 2nd for Cross the Pond. Bye-bye.